uh, committee members and staff, uh, welcome to the opening of the Joint Finance Committee budget uh, drafting session. Um, I'd like to, I think we could just start off. I'm going to ask our staff person, Lonnie, to uh, call the roll. And uh, if everybody can answer, if you're here, don't answer if you're not here. Lonnie? Representative Bolton? Present. You, me. Did you get me? Uh, Representative Briggs King? Present. It's not looking. He's not paying attention. He's he's right there. So say his call his name. Representative here. Carson. Right. Senator Ennis? Here. Representative Hensley? Representative Jakes? Present. Senator Lawson? Present. Senator Pardee? Here. Senator Richardson? Present. Senator Sturgeon? Here. Representative okay, Johnson? Present. Senator McDowell? Here. Oh, I think that can roll at 12 members, all members uh, present and answering. So again, welcome. Um, well, these are certainly um, strange and probably trying times. Um, but um, so I would like to take one moment to ask for a moment of silence uh, for Mr. George Floyd, who is the victim of a terrible atrocity. There's no other word for it. And uh, that kind of thing must be stopped in this country. So if we can bow one moment in silent prayer. Unmuted, I'm muted. Is that better? Okay. Um, so I just want to let you know that we, we, we have blocked out the dates of June 2 to 4 and June 8 to 9 for markup sessions. And we'll meet each day beginning at 10 a.m. And we'll hope to adjourn each day between 4 and 5 p.m. So that's a hefty day of work for this committee. And I hope we're all okay with that. Um, uh, now I want to turn to Director Mike Jackson of the Budget Office for an overview of the fiscal year 22, 2021 budget, which we're about to dive into. Mike? So, Senator, thank you. I just want to make sure can everybody hear me okay before I get into conversation. All good? Okay, so back uh, to... Uh, the 
the budget process, you know, we haven't been together since I would say the middle of March when you completed your your public hearing process for the proposed budget uh, that was introduced uh, to the legislature in the end of January. And what I like to do is, is go through very briefly, I would say the journey we've been on uh, since the time you've concluded your hearings, the onset of the virus and where we stand today in terms of our overall finances and then discuss a, uh, a potential plan forward over the next couple of days for your consideration as you deliberate the budget that was in front of you today. So uh, at the time the governor had introduced his budget, uh, we were experiencing what I would say uh, a $250 million surplus in our current year revenues. Uh, the governor had introduced a capital budget that was the uh, highest, uh, the most significant investment in the state's history, uh, including both transportation and non-transportation projects with a number of signature uh, requested investments in our schools, economic development, and within the environment. And you had had a budget that was uh, an operating budget that was introduced in front of you that was at a growth rate of 3.99%. Uh, it did include compensation policy for uh, state employees, uh, fully funding our teachers, uh, being able to make some strategic investments in targeted areas that you all have been focused on uh, the last couple of years, including child, child welfare investigators, investments in uh, our uh, provider community, investments in our Department of Correction, and investments in higher education. And since that time, uh, we have had significant changes in our revenue forecast uh, through the May revenue uh, forecast that was most recently adopted by uh, the Delaware Economic and Financial Advisory Committee. So to summarize in a nutshell, since the time the governor's budget was introduced, you had completed your hearings. The revenue forecast uh, that was used to construct the financial plan has been reduced by $619.2 million over fiscal year 2020 and fiscal year 2021. Uh, the, loss, the loss in revenue for the current year uh, is $325.1 million and the forecasted loss in revenue for fiscal year 2021 is $294.1 million. And without getting into uh, each uh, revenue category, I think it could be safe to summarize that what you are seeing is uh, significant reductions in our personal income tax collections, significant reductions in our corporate income tax collections, uh, reductions in our growth receipts tax collections, and reductions in our lottery uh, tax revenue. And we do have one more estimating committee meeting that will happen on June 17th, which has traditionally been used to finalize the, uh, the budget planning process. Uh, so what we have in front of, of you as a committee that will be using the, the May revenue estimates and the forecast at 98% appropriation limit uh, for uh, fiscal year 2021, subject to change come, come June DFAT. So even with those uh, changes in the revenue forecast, there are, there are a couple of what I would call linings uh, in the process of trying to be optimistic and not entirely pessimistic through the entire budget process. Uh, we have, uh, as we move through this process, we were confronted with uh, a $150 million shortfall in the current year budget uh, as revenue estimates started to unfold in, in March and April. Uh, we had actively worked through a plan of being able to maximize uh, additional federal funding that the state had received uh, through the CARES Act, one version of the federal stimulus package uh, for Medicaid, where there is an enhanced uh, federal share for Medicaid expenditures that allows us to, to spend uh, less on our Medicaid program from the state's general operating budget. We have seen reductions uh, in our personnel costs simply because our hiring has significantly slowed 
uh, over the last couple of months. We've been able to use some of those salary savings as one-time savings in the current year. And then on top of that, uh, we have been working over the last couple of years that as we've closed out our budget process uh, to be able to use funding that may not have been spent during the course of a fiscal year and continuing those funds and make them available for potential downturns in the economy. And we've been able to draw on them. The, the other two points that I would emphasize to all of you is, is that a combination of those types of uh, expenditure reductions in the current year, coupled with a slightly better forecast uh, that was approved by DFAC in May for the current year, uh, have put us in a position as a state from a $150 million shortfall in the current year to having a, a forecasted positive unencumbered balance uh, in our general fund uh, budget of $39.1 million, which is a very good place to be at this point. Uh, but we have been able to, to accomplish that without touching the state's rainy day fund and without utilizing the budget savings account that all of you have worked so hard on over the last two years of being able to, to set funds aside in anticipation of potential downturns to be able to use in your budget deliberations process uh, as, as you craft a, a budget from one year to the next. So uh, I, I would say just one note, I, I, I think our, our team at the uh, Office of Management Budget and our budget development section have just done a fantastic job of being able to help transition us along with a little bit of a better revenue forecast uh, to get to this point. Uh, when you're faced with that at the, with the last quarter of the fiscal year, it's, it's a significant challenge. And thankfully uh, with our, I would say intelligent budgeting over the last two years, we're a little bit better off than other states in the Mid-Atlantic region when we're dealing with our financial, our financial challenges. So, um, with that, I'll, I'll stop on the fiscal year 2020 to see if there, are, if there are any questions before we get into fiscal year 2021. And I believe, Mike, there are there is a page in their binder that maybe we might be referring to before we go through it. Uh, yes, for the financial plan, yes. Yes. So I believe everybody is is on that. It's the very first tab in your, in your uh, in your binder uh, that would walk us through what the amount of funding is available to, to, to spend based on the May uh, revenue forecast and uh, how that compares to the proposed budget and then some potential solutions as you work through this process over the next two weeks. So I, I'm gonna walk uh, through that one page document uh, that's titled fiscal year 2021 budget markup. And it's broken down into two boxes and the very top box uh, is referred to as box A, fiscal year 2021 appropriation limit. So I believe everybody is working off of the same, the same document. Uh, the, the first half of that box is the appropriation limit that was established uh, and forecasted by uh, DFAC at its May meeting. And you'll, the very first row is the, is the unencumbered balance that we're expecting at year end, given what I had just talked about of $39.1 million. You can add that to the, to the revenue forecast uh, for fiscal year 2021 of $4,524,200,000. The combination of those two numbers, given that we can only appropriate at 98% of revenues, based on our constitution and our laws, brings us to an appropriation limit of $4,472,000,000. And that is an appropriation limit, just to put that in perspective, that is very similar to the appropriation limit for fiscal year 2019. So we are working off of, in essence, a revenue forecast for fiscal year 2021 that is very similar in nature to two years ago. And that just gives perspective in terms of how significant uh, the impact has been on our revenue forecast since the time uh, you have been through your budget, your budget hearings. Below that, uh, you'll see a, a number of, of rows that refer to the budget. And just for perspective, uh, you have the governor's uh, level of recommended 
appropriations that you had your public hearings on for fiscal year 2021. And the very first row was the operating budget at $4,629,500,000. That is a 3.99% increase over the fiscal year 2020 budget. Uh, it builds on the last two fiscal years of having a fiscal year 2019 budget growth rate of just under 4%. Uh, I believe that was at 3.99% as well. The fiscal year 2020 operating budget growth rate of 4.24%. And now a proposed budget that was proposed at 3.99%. And the reason why I, I bring that up is because when you look at the last two years of investments in the operating budget, which are just coming off of a, a budget process a couple of years ago when we were faced with a $400 million budget challenge, uh, there were approximately $200 million worth of reductions made and $200 million worth of, I would say, resource changes to support uh, the ongoing needs of the state. And the last two years of, of growth itself with such minimal investments can really be summarized in, in, in five categories. One is you've invested in your people over the last two years through pay policy and as well as wage bargaining. You've invested in your schools primarily being able to fully fund teacher growth and changes within our enrollment uh, structure within our schools, school transportation costs. And you've been able to provide additional wraparound services for our schools in the areas of mental health, uh, funding for English language learners and funding for uh, children in low socioeconomic uh, status. So uh, on top of that, you've made investments in the provider community amongst the adult disability providers. You've made investments in the child care provider community, and then some very uh, high need areas in the state in child welfare investigators to meet our, our caseload standards, to help with a plan to meet our caseload standards, uh, towards investments in the Department of Corrections to address the independent review, investments uh, in higher education based on uh, uh, needs of each of our institutions. And my point is, is that when you look over the last two fiscal years, the operating budget on a combined rate uh, grew over 19 and 20 at $345 million, but 90% of that growth is in those five areas. And that is coming off of uh, a, a couple years removed from a $400 million budget challenge. So you do have an operating budget that is fairly, fairly lean. Um, and a proposed budget that, that uh, continued that trend with a growth rate of just under 4%. Below that, there is a, a one-time uh, appropriation bill that uh, primarily the largest uh, level of recommendations in that are around our elect upcoming elections for the fall uh, at, at around just under $4 million and then some ancillary costs associated with recapitalizing what are called our self-insurance uh, uh, funding needs and our, our legal costs. We're going to see a row that says the general fund cash to the bond bill. Uh, over the last couple of years, uh, this body, uh, based off of the leadership of the governor, has chosen to invest a significant level of one-time revenue into one-time initiatives in the capital budget. In fiscal year 2019, uh, the budget included almost $185 million worth of general tax revenue supporting capital projects. In fiscal year 2020, another hundred and roughly $90 million of general tax revenue supporting capital projects. And then the proposed budget includes $233 million worth of cash supporting capital projects uh, that are, were geared towards significant investments in our schools, the environment and economic development. Uh, but it simply shows the trend at which if we hadn't made those types of investments over the last couple of years and using one-time revenue to support one-time investments and keeping an operating budget um, at a level that was reasonable and kind of tied to the ongoing revenue growth, uh, our challenges in which you're going to, to, to deliberate over the next uh, however long you're here to develop a budget would be much, much more significant. And I think that is a, a, a fact. Um, because what you have in front of you when you look at the bottom of box A is when you compare our appropriation limit for fiscal year 2021 against the level of resources or budgets that were proposed to you, 
those budgets have to be reduced by $455.5 million. And without the very strategic growth that you have made over the last two years of keeping the operating budget at a reasonable rate tied to ongoing growth in our revenue, when you could have been able to grow our budget by seven, eight, nine percent in those respective years, by doing that, $455.5 million is still a significant challenge given the needs of the state. It is a much, much better position than uh, what you could have been in as an institution. And as much conversation as what we have had over the last several years, as difficult as what it has been, of being able to create consistency of building on a savings account to use uh, in times like this and minimizing operating budget uh, growth to strategic areas. Another silver lining is you're in a little bit of a better position than some of our surrounding states in New York, New Jersey, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. And I think that's a testament to, to all of you, to prior committee members, uh, as well as leadership within uh, the General Assembly, as well as all the members of the General Assembly of supporting such an approach uh, under the leadership of the governor. So uh, I'll pause there and see if there are any other comments before we get into what could be a rough uh, roadmap for your consideration uh, over the next couple of days. Mr. Chair. Commenting. Mr. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mike, for that information and presentation. And I want to echo what you just said in regards to where we are today. Certainly when we look at this, uh, these numbers, uh, a $455 million shortfall that we have to try to solve is certainly not a pretty picture. And I think it, the message will get lost a little bit in regards to it could have been an extremely much worse than what we're seeing now. And that is a testament to the methodologies that we have put in of processing our budget over the last several years. We have created a system that is definitely working. Uh, we have saved money. We're able to, as we talk through the path forward, tap into that money to solve some of these problems. But I think it is vital because we're going to not only solve this problem, but we must get back to and redo exactly what we did in the past, budget-wise, how we budgeted to be able to then deal with the future, whatever the future may hold. The other thing that you're going to see as we make these discussions and what we'll talk about is that I want to commend the departments that are working on our financial projections because they're doing it at a time of an extreme uncertainty. Our timing of our budget process clearly is not always the same as every other state. Different states have already either done their budget, have ex different time frames, whatever. We're right smack dab in the middle of everything that's happening. Um, we are just starting to reopen as a country. We don't know exactly what the true financial uh, fallout is going to be from the pandemic. Um, sadly, we start to hear about large companies and small companies declaring bankruptcy. Uh, if the federal benefits fall off, people not able to pay their mortgages or be able to pay their rent, things of that sort. All financial data is always delayed. And unfortunately, we're not going to know the true effects of this financial crisis until probably later in the summer or even early in fall. And for that reason, we've got to stay prudent to our principles of budgeting and know that we still not only have to have this problem to solve, but we're going to have to be prepared for any of the additional shortfalls that in my opinion are more likely to come. This is definitely a time where I hope I'm wrong, uh, but we have to plan for that. We have to plan for you know, what happens when we get into the third quarter uh, of the year and the financial picture turns down and we don't have revenue to, to meet those. And so while you're going to have, as members of this body, people reach out to you and say, please, you know, we need this funding, we need additional funding, we need whatever request we've put in there, we're unfortunately going to have to stay strong and make sure that we do have some tools in the toolbox to deal with that shortfall. But I do want to commend each and every one of you, because if you've been on this committee, you've sat there and stayed to the line of saving money when there were still things that we could have spent that money on. Congratulations, you're at that point where you're going to be able to now utilize that and solve a significant problem for the state of Delaware. So thank you. And I want to thank 
OMB as well as the Controller General staff because they have been working extremely hard, especially trying to close up that 2020 gap. Mike, I just and then the suggestions and the path forward ideas that that we're going to be going through uh, for consideration are all things that they've been working extremely hard on trying to make sure uh, where they could find uh, those savings and those uh, um, options, I should say. Uh, and it's been an extreme amount of work behind the scenes that uh, I'm sadly say that they never get credit for from the public because they're never seen by the public. But thank you to Mike, your guys' team, everybody, Mike and Mike, you guys done great and all the CG staff and OMB that aren't here. Please make sure that we send our, our gratitude for the work that's been done. So with that, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Co-Chair. That was an extremely good and important uh, analysis that you've given us. Uh, it, is, it is indeed what has driven the chairs and staff of this committee, and uh, I think will drive us. I would just, maybe to drive it home one degree, uh, just think of this. If we had had a, a, a th two or three months earlier deadline to produce the budget, we would have been out of here with a budget that had a lot more revenue in it uh, than, than here. And that would have made us have to come back and, and undo and redo. So uh, in that sense, when uh, Representative Johnson says, we're right at the crucial time for budgeting, that's probably best. So um, Mike, are you going to go to box B now? Or, or are we, do we have any more questions on uh, uh, Mr. Jackson's presentation? Seeing none. We would go into the CARES Act and do a little review of that. We're, we're going to go to the CARES Act. So, a just a suggestion, Mr. Chair, perhaps. Yes. Uh, we spend a great deal of time on the on the box A and maybe talk from a from a big picture perspective on box B on some some options that the committee as they uh, deliberate on a budget of kind of what it looks like from a 10,000 foot level. Good. Okay. Take us up. Okay. So uh, as the chair had said, uh, box B are is really a high level look at uh, potential solutions and one of the principles uh, that not just our office, but as well as the chairs and the controller general's office have been have been discussing, is to put a fiscal a fiscal plan in place that helps build a bridge from uh, fiscal year 2020 uh, to fiscal year 2022. Uh, and one of the reasons behind that philosophy is is that we've had a significant level of change uh, over the last couple of months, and we still don't know what we don't know. Uh, and we are a couple years removed from uh, a, a $400 million budget challenge. And what we wanted to try to do was create a, a, a fund a budget that in essence uh, maintains investments just that you have made uh, all the way up and through fiscal year 2020 and be able to make some adjustments for uh, some door openers such as uh, the school enrollment changes and being able to fund our teachers and school transportation costs and also being able to fund some growth uh, in the Department of Health and Social Services and technology needs such as such as cybersecurity. So the overall, what is in front of you is a, is a roadmap that does not raise taxes to be able to help address uh, the financial challenge, but what it does do is use some of the savings account that you have built up and keep some in reserve, uh, redirects dedicated revenue to fund general operations, at least for fiscal year 2021. And then also uh, has our office being able to continue to look for further expenditure reductions during the course of this year, as we are getting ready to close our fiscal year and taking money that is looking like it's not going to be spent and allowing that to, to build our surplus for this year to help fund operations for next year until we're able to have a clear picture of uh, the economy, until we're able to have a clear picture of uh, the virus. I know in, in the last 
uh, eight days or so that maybe conversation around the coronavirus has has taken a backseat to some very important and challenging events in our in our state and in our country. But we do have to recognize that it still uh, is a uh, an active virus in Delaware that could potentially impact you know our future revenue projections. So if you look at the top part of box B, you will see it says resources to support the fiscal year 2021 budget. And the very first line is, is that uh, Chris Hudson, who's our uh, director of budget development and her team in my office, the cabinet, working with the controller general's office, uh, feels that by the time we close this fiscal year out, that we should be able to find uh, a few additional uh, uh, dollars that won't be spent during the course of this year that could help grow uh, what would be called um, our forecasted positive unencumbered balance from that roughly $39 million, to almost $50 million, and using those resources to help support an operating budget. I talked about that a few minutes ago when we went through box A. Second is, in the second row is, you'll see a, a line that says deposit of realty uh, transfer tax and the public utility taxes that is dedicated to supporting open space and farmland and uh, uh, energy efficiency programs. It's about $25 million worth of revenue that is dedicated towards those specific uh, projects and redirecting that to the general operating budget to pay help pay for our operating expenses uh, for fiscal year 2021. Doesn't mean that those programs won't be funded, what it means is that those programs will have to compete for other for, for funding, just like all other capital projects in our bond bill. We have done that in the past during periods of economic downturn, most recently being in fiscal year 2018, uh, where there was a dedicated fund or uh, an appropriation for farmland uh, in lieu of a uh, depositing dedicated revenue to be able to fund it. And then lastly, uh, you'll see a row that says the budget stabilization fund. There's a current balance in that fund of $126.3 million. Uh, this uh, projected plan uses $76.3 million of that fund and keeps in reserve $50 million in the budget savings account in anticipation of potential future downturns in revenue. And I think that is an important point to keep in mind um, you know, that we, we may need resources, uh, as the impact on our economy becomes clear month by month. And what this does is provides a hedge and a little bit of a safety net to be able to draw on potential resources. Should we need them? Should we build the budget, uh, that the revenue forecast that used to build that budget doesn't come to fruition. And then below that, you will see reductions to the proposed budget uh, and absent going line by line and all of the details, I want to I want to touch on a couple of, of high points that I'm sure that you will uh, have a deliberation over as you get a little bit deeper into the agency by agency budget. The first row, it says eliminate discretionary funding requests. So you, the budget that was in front of you grew at 3.99%. The deliberations that you will go through will look at eliminating all of the discretionary requests that are, were included in the January budget proposal and only being able to direct any additional resources in the budget towards areas such as school enrollment growth and transportation growth for our schools and a couple other ancillary areas that in the document you'll be able to very clearly see. The, the next three items below eliminating discretionary funding requests relate to compensation policy. The governor did propose a, a third year of a pay raise for employees. Uh, given the significant changes in their revenue forecast and the amount of uh, resources that will uh, have to come out of the proposed plan in order to have a balanced budget, obviously that would have to be paused for fiscal year 2021. And in addition to that, uh, we do have uh, certain collective bargaining contracts as well as required salary step increases to pause those increases and put a trigger in the budget that if we do start to collect revenue that exceeds the final budget that you uh, uh, hopefully adopt by the end of June, uh, that it would trigger actually putting those increases in place. 
not including the general pay increase for state employees. And I'm sure we'll have a lot more deliberation over that. Uh, like we do may. Like if I may, on the uh, collective bargaining and step increases, are they going to be made whole or just reinstated at that moment? So I think one of our goals would be, and I'm sure it will be up for deliberation, would be to try to fund the contract in full for that year if we we're able to. Thank you. There seems to be some confusion and statements made recently as to what that is. And I'm sure we all got the calls. Yes. So, thank you. Excuse me. <laughs> State Park. State Park. Space Park. I, I, you know, okay. Space Park. But somebody keeps taking, putting it back on mute. So they, they say they can't mute. Me. Okay. Um, Mike, you're, uh, uh, you, you, have, you want to continue? Yeah, I'm almost done. I'm about halfway in the middle of the of the box B. Uh, we had just got done talking about compensation, and, and below that are uh, uh, a state and our personnel costs. This is not a, a policy impact, uh, but what this what this will do is uh, also restrict hiring during the course of fiscal year 2021. Uh, as I had mentioned before. We were able to help close some of our current year budget gap just based on the level of hiring. And we feel as though we can take a little bit of funding out of our statewide personnel costs to be able to help balance, balance our budget. Uh, below that, you'll see a line that says, reduce our debt service estimate due to bond refinancing. Uh, the Secretary of Finance uh, is, uh, in his prudence, is taking advantage of some very favorable interest rates and refinancing bonds that uh, we have sold in the past to be able to fund our construction projects. And uh, the latest estimates are, are that they will be able to reduce uh, our debt service costs by at least $13.5 million. In the proposed budget, there was a proposed increase of 16.4 million. And this is going to reduce that uh, pretty significantly as part of our overall budget sol solution. And it's, it's the prudent thing to do in the current climate where uh, 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 you know our our interest rates are at, at basically at a point where almost at, at zero percent, so it's a it's a smart move. Uh, below that is a is five point five million dollars of I would call discretionary expenditures to come out of the one time appropriations bill. As you recall, just a little bit ago in Box A, I shared that there was a one time appropriation bill of nine point nine million. Uh, this will reduce that to under 4.5 million, and it will only fund our election costs, as well as just recapitalizing our self-insurance uh, and legal funds uh, just based on activity. But the lion's share of it, the lion's share of it is related to our election costs. And then below that is a, uh, you'll see a, a line that says eliminate cash proposed to the bond bill for fiscal year 2021. Uh, and that is a significant part of the solution to be able to fund a budget, uh, kind of using a process to build a bridge from fiscal year 20 to fiscal year 2022. Uh, there will be no proposed cash to the bond bill uh, if you support uh, a plan that allows us to be able to fund fiscal year 2020 investments. And really our capital budget will end up being focused on making sure that we maintain our commitments in school construction make for what's already on the books and making sure that, you know, we continue to invest in our buildings uh, and that we continue to invest in economic development. We continue to invest in environmental infrastructure. It may not be to the degree that was proposed in January, uh, and it will not be to the degree that was uh, the last two fiscal years of capital investments. And it really comes down to simply the revenue forecast and the impact on our economy. And as a body, uh, always taking the position of being able to fund our general operating budget first, and this would be a significant part of the solution. And then lastly, just below that, you'll see uh, a slight adjustment to the grant and aid bill. Uh, I'll describe it this way. The grant and aid bill in fiscal year 2020 uh, included $1.8 million worth of one-time investments. 
And this plan simply takes those one-time investments out of the grant and aid bill. And you could look at it from this perspective uh, that agencies that receive grant and aid funding, fire companies, uh, senior centers, a variety of nonprofit organizations uh, would be in a position as you deliberate to continue the same level of funding in fiscal year 20 uh, into fiscal year 2021. So in that uh, is basically the uh, a very high level rough roadmap to be able to help support and maintain investments in the budget made through fiscal year 2020 using our savings account as part of the solution and being able to build, uh, I would say, a bridge between the fiscal year that we're about ready to close into the planning process for fiscal year 2022, where we have a much, much better sense of uh, the economic impact of the virus and exactly where the virus is going. Thank you, uh, Mike. Uh, are there any questions of Mr. Jackson at this point on box B? Seeing none, uh, Mike, thank you very much for you and your staff's work here. And I think we need to go to the next tab. You want to hold up? Senator, I think uh, next thing we want to do is just, uh, again, have uh, Dr. Jackson do a quick overview of the uh, CARES funding. I think there have been, CARES funding. Yeah, there have been okay. several questions from uh, legislators about how that interacts with the budget, whether it can or can can or cannot help us in our deliberations over the next uh, week or so. So I'll turn it over to uh, turn over to Director Jackson. Yeah, to go to Director Jackson. Thank you. Just a quick question for the controller general. Do, do the committee members have a copy of the very brief overview? Is that gonna come on screen, Mike? He's going to put it on the screen for us to be able to see through your computer. He's just working on that now. So as soon as it pops up, then Mike Jackson can start. And there you go. Okay. So if we're ready to, to start off, I'll, I'll provide a, a, a brief summary. And, and what is on the screen is uh, this a portion of the a presentation that was done at one of the governor's press conferences a couple of weeks that included a slight budget overview and an overview of the CARES Act. So uh, just some, some very quick background. The, the phase, I would call phase three, of the stimulus uh, legislation that was considered by Congress uh, through the month of uh, April included uh, funding for states to be able to uh, help cover costs that are related to the pandemic. And Delaware uh, received an allocation and a share of those costs that totaled $1.25 billion uh, and as a small state, uh, $1.25 billion is about 25% of our overall operating budget. Uh, the legislation also, the federal legislation, also included a provision uh, for all states that if there were local governments that had a population of over 500,000 residents, that there was a formula that would distribute a portion of the state's share of funding directly to those local governments. And Newcastle County government is one of those entities within the state that has a population of over 500,000 uh, residents when you include the city of Wilmington, Newark, Middletown, and uh, a few of the other incorporated uh, communities in the county. So the county received a direct allocation of $322.8 million of the state's 1.25 billion. So the resources directly under the state's purview uh, is $927.2 million. And that represents just under 25% of our budget. 
Uh, and I want to talk very briefly about uh, some of the uh, kind of rules around the fund and how these funds can be used. So if you go to the second page, which uh, the Controller General has put up on our screen, uh, the intent of the funding is that for states and others, local governments, to be able to use it to help pay for COVID-related expenditures that are over and above the most recently adopted budget for the state. So it's COVID-related expenditures that are over and above the most recently adopted budget for the state. And what that means for us is that uh, we are experiencing, obviously, impact from the, from the virus and having to uh, expend funds to be able to, whether it's for personal protection equipment, whether it's for uh, being able to fund initiatives that are already in our budget uh, and, and paying for them, that is how we're, we're using these funds. So there are three principles uh, in terms of an eligible expense. One is, is that it has to be COVID related. Second is, is that it can, is not already accounted for in the fiscal year 2020 state budget and that the expenditures have to be incurred between March 1st, 2020 and December 30th, 2020. And one major caveat is that the federal guidance is very clear in that the uh, what's called the Coronavirus Relief Fund, it's the CARES Act funding, cannot be used to replace revenues lost as a result of the pandemic. So when I had shared a little earlier that the state had experienced a forecasted revenue loss of $619.2 million over fiscal years 2020 and fiscal years 2021, we cannot use this funding for that purpose. There was also one other major caveat, which is if the Inspector General of the US Treasury, um, after the fact, after we're through this process, deems that we use the funds for an ineligible purpose, a purpose that was not COVID related, a purpose that was not already accounted for in our budget, a purpose where we incurred an expense prior to March 1st, where we used it for revenue loss, that as a state, we would have to pay those funds back to the United States Treasury. And that's a little bit different than federal funding that we have received in the past. Uh, I, I know during our, our, uh, the beginnings of the Great Recession, uh, the federal government provided funding to states to be able to help relieve pressures uh, on the budget that they were planning for. Uh, this funding is a little bit different in that it's intended to relieve pressures on budgets that were already adopted and have to be very specific and related to the pandemic. So with those and that one caveat in terms of uh, the overarching principle of if it's not COVID related that we would have to pay back as a state, we've taken some, I would say, fairly uh, aggressive uh, approaches to making sure that we are set up as a state to track our COVID related expenditures. So we do have the appropriate uh, mechanisms in our personnel uh, payroll system in our accounting system. Uh, we are working extremely closely uh, with our state's Department of Justice on the interpretation of programs that are being, uh, that should be used, that, that will be funded or expenses that will be funded from our CARES Act funding. In case we ever get into a position of uh, disagreement with the federal government down the road, uh, of having a, a consistent methodology for how we applied uh, the funding. And then lastly, uh, given, I, I wanna make sure that I touch base on this, which is uh, we are also uh, working with the Kent County government and Sussex County government. Uh, they've been helpful partners uh, in helping us begin to collect uh, from our municipalities in Kent County and Sussex County what they deem as being COVID-related 
uh, expenditures, and we will be having a, a review process on that. Uh, you know, as we kind of finish this, our, our budget process here, which will also include our controller, controller general staff and, and a few others, as we kind of sift through the impact on each of our municipalities, including our, our county governments. Um, on, on top of that, you see a, uh, a slide, and it's the last slide in the presentation that talks about preliminary estimates of the coronavirus relief fund. And, and I want to caveat uh, some of the, the dollar amounts that are on here uh, with really two items. One is, uh, it's a little bit dated, it's, about, it's a couple weeks old, and our numbers will change every day. Uh, each month, we learn more about the impact uh, on our current year budget, and each month, we learn more about um, the impact uh, on uh, certain programs within the state. And, and without going through the entire slide, I want to be able to touch on just a couple of points, and I think there are significant points. And you're going to see in the lower right-hand portion of the slide, uh, in blue, it says the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund. When the CARES Act funding was released, um, it was very, very unclear whether or not we would be able to use any of the, any of the funding to support the state share of claims for the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, the United States Treasury came out and said that, that it would be a eligible expense that we could use our CARES Act funding to be able to support additional claims out of the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund. And the reason why that is significant is because at the most recently uh, reviewed, uh, at the most recent DFAC meeting where we review revenue and, and and expenditure information. It was a it was a discussion and a and a and a slide that shared claims from the unemployment insurance trust fund, really through the first month, and there were eighty five thousand claims against the unemployment insurance trust fund. Those claims, in terms of the state share of payments, because we have to keep in mind that there is an enhanced federal unemployment insurance uh, benefit of six hundred dollars. Uh, and I'm just referring to, and that's paid for by the federal government through another source of funding. I'm just referring to the state share of the first month of unemployment insurance claims for those 85,000 claims was $63 million. A normal month, a normal month is approximately 4 million. So I, you can, uh, you know, I usually use a calculator when I'm doing math. Uh, on this one, I'm not sure that you have to, at a rate of almost $60 million net a month beyond what we're paying, if the current rate continues just through from August, that's an initial $300 million. If it occurs through October, could be as high as over $400 million. If it occurs through the end of December, could be as over a half a billion dollars worth of claims. So it is significant, but the important point is this, is that being able to use the CARES Act funding towards helping cover those additional claims, and there's work that we have to do with the Department of Labor, helps our, helps our businesses in the long run. Because if we did not use these funds for that purpose, the way that our Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund works is, is that as our businesses are trying to uh, uh, come out of the impact of the virus, there would be triggers in place to raise the unemployment insurance tax to be able to help replenish the fund, which is, I think it, it is a regressive approach as we're trying to do everything that we can to help our businesses and using these funds to be able to help cover that cost. Uh, and it could be upwards of half of the $927 million. I think we all can agree that that is a, a, a positive, positive approach. Uh, to be able to do that. I don't know if any members want to make a comment on that or anything. If not, I'll, I'll keep going. Senator Pardee had a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jackson. I, uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Jackson, you and I have had some of this last week now. Uh, we do have uh, some more comments that we uh, see. Uh, 
me get unmuted there. We do have some nonprofits that uh, that receive funding through grant and aid that are uh, experiencing significantly more costs. One of the things that that comes to me to mind for me in my district is the Modern Maturity Center. Um, which is putting out significantly more meals uh, each day throughout the community, uh, incurring uh, significantly more costs as, as a result for those for those meals. So, um, and and when we spoke about this last week, you said you would that this is one of the, the areas that you and your team were looking into to determine whether um, or not you know those types of programs, whether it be through Modern Maturity Center or through you know some of the other nonprofits that that deliver really critical services up and down the state, whether or not we would be able to use some of the CARES Act money to uh, offset some of those expenses. And I was just uh, wondering whether you and your team had made any, uh, uh, you know, had made any uh, progress in terms of determining uh, whether those types of programs might be eligible for some of the funding. So, so it's a good, good question, Senator. And I would say not yet. It is an ongoing discussion, and, and, and the primary reason is, is because as you look across, uh, really on the slide here, as, as we know more, and we know more what some of these programs are going to, to cost us, that allows us to be able to kind of, I would say, uh, go a little bit further with the funding uh, that we have, that is um, uh, to be able to help supplement that. The other piece is, is that, uh, some of the uh, nonprofit organizations did receive uh, direct funding through some of the stimulus funding that uh, was appropriated. I'll give just one example. You know, there was a federal program uh, for congregate and home delivered meals uh, to be able to help deal with the additional costs associated with continuing to provide their service uh, beyond. So. It, it, it's going to continue to be looked at. I just don't have a definitive answer for you today. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Uh, to, to the committee, I want to say it's a little bit, this seating arrangement is somewhat new and it's a little hard for me to, so make sure you get your hand up. Either the staff will, will recognize you or I will, but we, we don't want to miss you. Uh, next we have Representative Bolden. Okay. Can you hear me now? All right. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My question is uh, regarding the um, CARES Act funding. Now, you mentioned that you would, the state is working with Kent and Sussex County. How is Newcastle County uh, using their $222.8 million um, in reference to the CARES Act? So... Representative Bolton, it's, it's actually 322.8 million. Three, 322.8? Yes, that's the amount that went to the county. Um, I, I actually would defer to the county in terms of their intentions of using those funds. I do know that the, uh, the, the county council uh, did adopt an ordinance to spend about $85 million of their allocation and that they are in the process of deciding other options uh, to uh, for the remaining balance. If, if you don't mind, I'd like to add to that, Representative. The uh, uh, the the three hundred twenty million represents a more than one hundred percent increase in Newcastle County's revenue, even if you add the sewer fund money into the calculation. Well, also, will they? Um in, in looking at this chart, does any of that go to the unemployment trust fund in reference to Newcastle County that are people are applying for unemployment? So representative, I, I, I can't speak for the county's uh, share of funding of whether or not they would contribute to that. I know that we have uh, had an ongoing discussion with them. I think it'll be an ongoing dialogue as we know more and as they know more of their plans in terms of the impact. But at this point, our, our our only avenue is to plan on just using the, the state share that came to the state to be able to uh, apply towards the unemployment insurance trust fund. And there are Newcastle County businesses that will, you know, obviously benefit from that uh, in the long run, as much as there are in Kent and Sussex.
Is there any way we can obtain information regarding, because we're, we're looking at, we're sitting here doing a budget for the entire state and Newcastle County is a part of the state. Am I still muted? You're good. Okay. So I, I, I know there have been talks, but there should be more information given to us, I think, at, at this body, uh, knowing how this money is being used when we have to do the budget, which includes Newcastle County. I think that right now we have to trust the ongoing discussions, uh, which have been up and down, I think, between the budget office and, uh, and the county. Uh, the nearest I can figure, the county is not extremely cooperative at this point. Well, I, I'll say this. I think it's just it's an ongoing dialogue. And one of our one of our challenges is, is that and it's indicative on the pages is, is that we are we we are approaching really the, the third month of being able to realize what we're what we're paying for. Um, you know, much of our expenditures started to happen in April. We had May, you know, through, I, I believe it was May 26, you know, we had incurred almost $65 million worth of expenses over and above our budget. And that does not include the unemployment insurance trust fund. It only includes the first month of enhanced reimbursement for child care centers. Uh, it, it only includes roughly the first month of uh, allocations towards our hospitality industry for the loan program that's helping them uh, as best as what we can meet some of their, their fixed costs. And it only includes a fraction of the applications received for the rent and utility assistance applications uh, that are, which we've had over 5,000 of those applications come in for $1,500 per household. So I think it's, it's a question of, you know, we learn more, they develop further plans, and I think there will hopefully will be a point where, you know, we come to a place of consensus with the county, and uh, I'm sure we will do that with Kent and Sussex as well. Representative Jakes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Uh, I just want to ask Mr. Jackson when he considers uh, modern maturity for their Meals on Wheels program that he doesn't forget you are a senior center who does almost as much as uh, modern maturity. They have a much yeah. bigger uh, clientele. So just include that, please. Uh, understood, Representative. I, I, I just I want to underscore one point, and I'm going to say it again. And it's a, it's a it's it's the most important point out of all of this. The Expenditures from the fund need to be COVID related expenditures over and above our budget. So what may be deemed a COVID related expenditure in one organization as we take it through our review process, which also includes our state's attorney general's office, we may not agree. Um, so I need to make sure that that is at least out there for our consistent understanding largely because of if we have something that is deemed to be ineligible, we are, will be required to pay it back. Mike, I see no further questions. You have more to go? I, I, I have no uh, uh, really further information on, on this beyond what is on the slide and what we have discussed. I think, you know, the main point is, is that when you, when you look at the types of expenditures that are occurring out of the fund, they are for programs that uh, this body has included in its budget or has included as uh, a, a part of the state's financial operation, including the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund. So be happy as we move through more and more through this process to provide regular updates to the committee in terms of what we learn from one month to the next be happy to do it through the Controller General's office, be happy to do it through both of the chairs, because uh, I think it's an important issue for us as a, as a state through the rest of this calendar year. Then it breaks King. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up um, on one of the comments that um, Mike had made earlier about how some of the not-for-profits in Delaware were able to get money directly. And I think it would be helpful to us in our decision process moving forward, either grant and aid or this, if we could get um, an idea from them about how much that they have received or will be receiving, because we know that offsets the need. So, you know, if in fact, you know, um, 
Cheer Services provides a lot of the meals and everything in Sussex yeah. County. And I know they we're getting additional funds as perhaps as modern maturity. I think it would be helpful if we could have an idea of the total allocations they've gotten through the federal programs that were available for not-for-profits so that we're not trying to to um, to fill a to fill a um, a bucket, if you will, that might already be partially full. Thank you, Representative uh, Senator Richardson. You had a question earlier. Do you uh, still have it? Uh, Senator Lawson answered it for me. Thank you. Any further questions, uh, Sen Senator Pardee? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, just to uh, follow up on on what. Uh, Representative Ruth, uh, Ruth uh, Briggs King said, "Is um, uh, you know having having an idea of what the nonprofits have received from the federal government, but but also you know perhaps trying to get some information from them as to any other uh, shortfalls along with that uh, that that they currently have, um, just so we have kind of a complete idea of of where they where they stand and and what their needs are going forward." Michael. Uh, yes. Okay. So uh, next up, uh, typically this time we we have handed out or sent out to committee members a technical adjustment list. Uh, I don't know whether anybody has any questions, but this is a list that we typically share with you each year. Uh, again, they are technical. They're not policy related at all. Uh, in fact, they net out uh, zero additional ASF for general fund dollars. Uh, in all, there's a net one new general fund position when you um, add up all the NSF, ASF, and general fund positions. That new position is a clearinghouse position for the, uh, what is it, the Fodded Lantern Sly. Uh, but again, much of these are uh, position transfers between departments, among uh, within departments. Many of them are Section 11 uh, epilogue transfers, which are positions which come open uh, throughout the course of the year due to attrition or, or uh, vacancies, what have you. Uh, the the uh, director of management budget has the authority to take those positions, move them to uh, areas of workforce needs. Uh, they Those transfers, again, have to have my, my concurrence as well. So this list is basically reflective of all those changes that have happened over the past uh, fiscal year to align positions with where they now stand uh, within the uh, department. So unless there are any questions from committee members, uh, we'd like to take a vote on the technical adjustment list. Yep, sure. I lost audio. Are we having technical difficulties? Do you have the document? There you go. No, now it's back. So I can only hear. Well, Harris is on mute, that might've been the problem. But for a while I lost all audio of any sounds in the chamber or anybody. Harris, talk, let me see if I can hear you. Yeah, I'm here. We're now it's working back. on. Okay. Just wanna make sure I can vote. Is she, is she on now? I'm here. You just hold it. Okay. Right. Does anybody have any comments about the technical adjustments list? There is.
Senator Lawson. Yes, Mr. Morton. Uh, not that I'm aware of. Nor I. I did. Senator, do you mind asking your question again? I, I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry. The question was, the question was, I believe that uh, were any of these put back in in the epilogue? And I believe in other words, sometimes whenever we do cuts, they come back uh, around. Okay. Yeah. So no. I'm, I'm yeah, asking so if there's a back door here. That's it. No. No, that is the short and simple answer. These are technical changes to where positions are today in the budget and making sure they're in the correct, correct budget unit. It's not, it's not a policy decision or, and you won't see any epilogue around uh, okay. some, of the, uh, some of the movements with one caveat. And I, want to, and I think it's a it's an important one to make in the in the line for services for children, youth and their families. You'll see a page one page. It's on page one, the summary. The line that says services for children, youth and their families. You'll see a, a number of positions that are reduced as well as the funding. And if you go down to education, and if you just look at the funding column, you'll see the same amount. Of funding. Those are, those are, they net to zero in the budget, but they are related to legislation that was passed prior session on moving the Office of Child Care Licensing from the Kids Department to the Department of Education. I bring it up because there may be epilogue just to um, actualize kind of some, how we implement some piece of it, but don't have a fiscal impact and we're not backdooring any positions. But I didn't want you to be surprised when you see the language. Okay. So they're just switch funding. They're just moving from one department to another based on legislation that you passed. Thank you very much, I appreciate okay. that. Are there any further questions? Uh, Representative Jakes. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. I, I would like to make a motion to accept the technical statement, pages 1 through 19. Second. There may be some questions. Uh, hold on. Do we have let, let's Okay. Go ahead and motion before. Well, he's, he's taking the co chair's job, Earl. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, you're good. Therefore, let me repeat since he was on mute and actually get paid for the job I'm supposed to do. <laughs> I make a motion that we approve the technical adjustments that go from page one through page in our binder stated in that era discussed by OMB Director Mike Jackson and Controller General Mike Moore. Second. Yeah, we have a second. <clears throat> we, have, we have a deaf man out here, I think. Okay, moves and seconded. Are there any questions on the motion? Representative Bolden. Uh, thank you. Yeah, um, Mr. Jackson, I'm sorry, I didn't get to hear your explanation in terms of what was being moved from um, services for youth and family. Okay, and so are we eliminating positions from there or what? Can you just explain that? Because I wasn't clear on that. Sure, Representative Bolden, uh, we are uh, moving the Office of Child Care Licensing from the kids department to the Department of Education based on legislation passed by the General Assembly last session. You're welcome. Representative Bolden. 
Representative Briggs King? Aye. Representative Carson? Representative Carson? Aye. Senator Annis? Yes. Representative Hensley? Yes. Representative Jakes? Yes. Senator Lawson? Yes. Senator Purdy? Yes. Senator Richardson? Yes. Senator Sturgeon? Yes. Representative Johnson? Yes. Good suggestion. Senator McDowell? Yes. Someone ought to sit next to Harris. Somebody, yeah. One, One of the staff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Um, uh, just so we can sort of get into the flow of things uh, before we take anything too difficult before lunch, uh, I think we will tune, uh, turn to uh, doing some boilerplate epilogue language. Uh, in your books, you will see uh, tabs for all the agencies. Uh, what we will do is start with uh, legislative. You'll have a tab in your book for that. Uh, for those that are following uh, live, the section numbers and page numbers that we will be referencing here are direct will be the same as what's in the governor's recommended budget. And what we will be doing here is my analyst will be come up, come up and explain the sections that are uh, boilerplate for that agency. And by boilerplate, we mean uh, sections that we are that are not controversial that have been in the budget for year after year after year. Uh, so you're not look, you're not voting on any policy related items or any items that may have a bearing on future votes that we're going to take in section one, uh, the number section. So with that, if we go through these, uh, we will uh, do entire departments at a time, except for some of the larger ones, uh, and take one vote at the end. If there are any that you have additional questions for, uh, my analyst will attempt to. Attempt to answer them. If we need more information, we can put them on hold. Or if there are any that you feel you don't want to vote on at this time, we'll put on hold and catch them when we uh, finish up at the end of our deliberations. But again, the idea here is to go through these relatively quickly, uh, take votes on the boilerplate uh, language and move on as best we can uh, up until lunch. And then we'll continue that after lunch as well. So uh, with that, we will start with the legislative tab, and I will turn it over to Ruth Ann in my office. It says it's legislative. legislative. Your tab is marked as legislative, and it's page 117. We're starting with section 33. All right, section 33 in legislative makes the research assistant to the Sunset Committee an exempt position. Section 34 requires the chairs of legislative committees to submit requests for professional staff assistance through legislative council. Section 35 says that expense requests from task forces and committees must be submitted to legislative council. And section 36 sets the controller general's compensation at the same rate of a tier two cabinet position. That completes the epilogue sections for legislative. Okay, uh, that reads of, uh, that's reading of the uh, uh, 33 through 36. Do we have any questions? If not, I see no questions. Lonnie, can you call the roll? Oh, we need a motion first. Sorry, Senator. Oh, sorry, I, I, we keep I, trying to cut your water. I'll take, yeah, no, I'll take care of this. Those. So I make a motion that we, under the legislative tab, approve sections 33, 34, 35, and 36 as written and presented. Second. Representative Bolden. Voting yes. Representative Briggs King? Voting yes. Representative Carson? Yes. Senator Annis? Yes. Representative Hensley? Yes. Representative Jakes? Yes. Senator Lawson? Yes. yes. Senator, Senator Pardee? Yes. yes. Senator Richardson? Yes. Senator Sturgeon? Yes. Representative Johnson? 
Yes. Senator McDowell. Yes. Okay. Uh, announce. All right, what's the next page? Well, it's been passed unanimously, so we'll do go to the... Yes, uh, next tab will be uh, judicial. Uh, Jason? Are we still doing... Ep so we're Jason, you're up. We still we'll doing on the epilogue. judicial tab. Yes, we're looking at epilogue under the judicial tab. Starts with yeah. section 37. Okay. This is long, so take your time. <laughs> <laughs> so section 37 states that upon approval of a plan that the Chief Justice has the ability to transfer positions from individual courts in Newcastle County to the Administrative Office of the Courts for centralization purposes. Section 38 appropriates uh, ASF authority to the Court of Chancery to cover personnel and operating costs of the statewide Register and Chancery Office and the Court of Common Pleas to cover personnel and operating costs for four FTEs. Section 39 requires that any current or any future master in chancery or chief staff attorney positions shall receive the same salary as the commissioner in the Superior Court. Section 40 appropriates contractual court appointed attorneys, court appointed special advocate or CASA attorneys, and family court civil attorneys and upon approval provides the Chief Justice with a few tools related to these programs to maximize recruitment and retention of qualified attorneys. Section 41 instructs the Administrative Office of the Courts to coordinate with DTI to develop electronic document systems, uh, projects for the court, and also allows for the Administrative Office of the Court to enter into licensing agreements or other contracts with private companies on behalf of the courts for electric document systems. Uh, section 42 authorizes one FTE to the Delaware Nursing Home Residence Quality Assurance Commission. Section 43 uh, requires the Court of Chancery to transfer ASF cash annually to the Office of the Public Guardian for one FTE position, as well as transfer uh, ATF ASF cash annually to the Department of Safety and Homeland Security for the cost of Capitol Police Officer at the Court of Chancery in Sussex County. And section 44 instructs that a contractual uh, CASA attorney that was allocated in uh, fiscal year 2012 shall be used in both Kent and Sussex County. And section 45 uh, essentially authorizes the maintenance of an ASF account with the state treasurer for all revenue generated from court fees and fines uh, or court fees and costs associated with court rules. Uh, once the balance hits 1.2 million, unless it's otherwise designated, all revenue over that amount is deposited into the general fund. Uh, this section further provides that the judiciary submit a plan uh, to the Office of Management and Budget Director and the Controller General detailing plan expenditures for the upcoming fiscal year. And the last section in the judicial uh, section here, or section 46, refers to one-time funds held pursuant uh, to former Superior Court Rule 16.1 of which half are deposited into the general fund and the other half is spent on uh, work related to CENTAC, the Access to Justice Commission and the Criminal Justice Council for the judiciary as determined by the Chief Justice. Uh, that concludes uh, epilogue sections for judicial. Thank you. All right, seeing no questions then under the judicial, judicial tab, I make a motion that we approve section 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, and 46 as written and presented. Second. <sighs> Representative Bolden? Yes. Representative Briggs King? Yes. Representative Carson? Yes. Senator Ennis? Yes. Representative Hensley? Yes. Representative Jakes? Yes. Senator Lawson? Yes. Senator Pardee? Yes. Senator yes. Richardson? Yes. Senator Sturgeon? Yes. 
Representative Johnson? Yes. Senator McDowell? Yes. 12 yes. Here's some good news. We're going to take a break for lunch. So uh, uh, we will break for uh, somebody. Tell me what time it is. Is that correct time? Yes. So, so let's say we'll come back in uh, 45 minutes. Is that sufficient? Okay, 45 minutes from now. The committee will stand in recess.
two. Call the committee back to order. Okay, uh, we're going to pick up where we left off on boilerplate epilogue. Uh, so we will uh, begin with tab executive, page 121 of the governor's recommended budget, section 47. And I'll turn it over to Ruthie. Or, I'm sorry, Jason. <laughs> you get stuck with me. <laughs> so, again, um, as Mike said, we are on the executive tab. We are starting on section 47. Uh, Section 47 appropriates funding for educational reimbursement to local law enforcement officers. Section 48 states that uh, budget position 879 shall receive compensation at the rate of a tier three level cabinet position. Uh, Section 49, we would actually uh, re request to put this on hold. Um, Section 50 allows funds within the reserve account for children's services cost recovery project disallowances. Uh, to mitigate projected deficits in the uh, temporary assistance for needy families and supportive programs within DHSS. Uh, Section 51 requires funding in the prior year's obligation appropriation to be used for personnel costs and other obligations. Uh, Section 52 requires state agencies to implement a hiring review process and all positions must be reviewed and approved by the Secretary of DHR and the Director of OMB prior to filing. It also gives the director OMB authority uh, to extend temporary promotions. Section 53 authorizes the director of OMB and the secretary of DHR to implement an overtime management practices review for state agencies. And it requires that the director provide a report to the governor and the co-chairs of JFC by May 1st of each fiscal year. Section 54 appropriates ASF authority and the contingencies and one times items to make adjustments in the event of uh, additional state special funds are received. Section 55 states that the necessary adjustments to human resource benefits and payroll procedures shall be implemented with the written approval of the co-chairs of JFC, the director of OMB, and the controller general. Section 56 states that whenever the market value of assets in the special pension fund, when it exceeds the actuarial value of benefits available to persons entitled to receive pensions, by 20% or more that the Board of Pension Trustees must then transfer that access to the State Employees Pension Fund. Section 57 allows the Board of Pension Trustees to allocate pension health insurance monies received from the state to ensure that the funds are available to pay health insurance premiums each month and pension benefits. Section 58 states that OMB shall retain rental fees as ASF authority. Section 59 states that certain annual ASF appropriations are within OMB for maintenance and snow removal costs that are associated with PMBs, the Transportation uh, Mobile Center, and the Del Dot Administration Building. Uh, Del Dot is to remit these costs to OMB. Section 60 states that OMB's current fiscal year energy budget assumes that Del Dot Motor that Del Dot's motor fuel tax section uses 10% of the public safety building, and Del Dot is responsible for paying that portion. Section 61 allows state agencies to pay for employee parking in the government parking in the government center parking garage for employees uh, employed prior to May 31st, 1998. Section 62 designates funds within OMB for statewide technology initiatives. Section 63 states that special funds may be deposited into the general fund as a measure to control expenditures. Uh, the director of OMB must notify the co-chairs and the controller general as to any such deposit. Section 64 states the maximum allowable senior property tax credit is the lesser of 50% of the tax or $400. Section 65 appropriates funding for one FTE exempt senior secretary from criminal justice council dedicated to the executive director of the domestic violence coordinating council. Uh, section 66 states that the criminal justice council will provide administrative support and fiscal oversight to the board of parole and the Criminal Justice Council shall develop reporting requirements for the board. Uh, reports are submitted to the board by the CJC, OMB, and uh, the Office of the Controller General. Uh, Section 67 authorizes DELGIS to use up to 260,000 in ASF funds for operational costs. Section 68 states that the Delaware State Housing Authority shall be responsible for administering the neighborhood assistance tax credit to foster business investment in low-income communities. 
DSHA must submit an annual report by May 1st of each year to the Director of OMB and the Controller General detailing the list of expenditures and projects. Section 69 states that the State Rental Assistance Program shall be administered by DSHA and the Director of DSHA. DSHA shall report to the Director of OMB and the Controller General no later than November 15th and March 15th on those expenditures. Section 70 allows the OMB Director to transfer the unspent general fund balance at the end of the fiscal year in excess of the 2% set aside into the Budget Stabilization Fund. And lastly, Section 71 allows the OMB Director and the Controller General to supplement the Delaware National Guard Education Assistance Corporation with funding from the contingencies and one times to the extent possible. Uh, that concludes the uh, log summary for the executive session, or section, sorry. <laughs> Thank, Thank, you. Thank you, just a couple questions for clarification. Um, in section 66, when it talks about um, the appropriation of the one FTE, um, when I was looking back through the actual budget, it looked like some of that had been um, cut. So I was just trying to make sure I'm looking at the right thing for an ex expl explanation on that. So we're, it, it talks that we're appropriating and it's additional funds there in an FTE. Um, and it looked like that was something that had either not been recommended or not approved in the budget. So I was just trying to find where that was. And I think it's around page um, seven of the, uh, of the, um, Oh, okay. All right, because I was, I was just wondering if we're approving something in Epilogue that we haven't voted in. That was my concern. Senator Lawson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question on section 61. Could someone explain that parking issue to me, please? So, <laughs> sorry, I'm mute. Uh, Jason, do you have no, okay. So, uh, there's two questions, maybe for clarity. Representative Briggs King, I believe, is looking at um, the a, a in the proposed budget, there were some enhancements to positions in the Criminal Justice Council that are separate and distinct from the epilogue language that you're that you just reviewed. And one thing that once you get to that section of the uh, of the budget for the Criminal Justice Council, uh, you know, you'll have the opportunity, I guess, to, to discuss and debate whether you want that position in or out. But it, it's not related to the epilogue language that you just reviewed. And then to Senator Lawson's question, this is a long-standing epilogue language that for employees, uh, the parking garage itself is a contractual arrangement. And uh, when the parking garage went through a series of renovations uh, and, and a third party vendor who's operating it, there was a decision that was made that employees who were receiving state resource, receiving state funds as what would be called imputed income or an enhanced benefit prior to 1998 would continue to be able to receive that benefit from the state. But after a certain point in time, uh, they are not eligible to be able to receive parking assistance for working in the public state office building. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, just a follow up question. I, I think we were supposed to, and we may have received it and I just don't recall the um, SRAP report around March 15th from the housing authority. So, cause it, we're supposed to get those a couple times a year and given the fact that they've had the increased usage of that and we're not increasing their funds this year. I just wondered if we had any, if we did in fact get their March 15th report. Yes, I will look into the report and get it to Representative Prince King. Senator Lawson, you all right? Uh, all right. Uh, uh, see, I need Mr. Co Chair. I think. Yep. 
I'd like to make a motion that we adopt uh, under the executive branch sections 40. Yep, actually, uh, Senator Representative Bolden has a question. Representative Bolden. Sorry. Representative Bolden. All right, thank you, sir. Can you hear me now? Okay, great. My question, again, is going back to section 64 um, in reference to the um, provision for seniors. And it says here, at such time as a means of test programs may be implemented. When, when are those programs implemented or have they been implemented? And going forward, you know, can you just give me a better explanation of what this is set, it's, it's, uh, entailing? I can't hear you. Okay. Um, uh, the uh, means tested was supposed to be developed by the Department of Finance. Uh, we have not heard of any program that they have offered to uh, the General Assembly or to the administration to uh, implement means testing. So it continues without uh, answer, as best as I can say. So until that's developed. Uh, I, do, do, uh, do you want to put this on hold and we can have them respond back to the General Assembly, to the Joint Finance Committee as to uh, when they may or may not be able to implement it? And if not, why not? Correct. We will put that one on hold and come back to you with uh, new language to that effect. Mike Morton, what section was that, please? Uh, section 64. Okay, I make a motion that we approve sections 47, 48, put 49 on hold, approve 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, putting 64 on hold, approve 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, and 71 as written under the executive tab. All right, I motion for it to Moved and seconded. Any questions on the motion? Uh, let's have the roll call vote by the staff. Representative Bolden? Yes. Representative Briggs King? Yes. Representative Carson? Yes. Senator Ennis? Yes. 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 Representative Hensley? Yes. Representative Jakes? Yes. Senator Lawson? Yes. Senator Pardee? Yes. Senator Richardson? Yes. Senator Sturgeon? Yes. Representative Johnson? Yes. Senator McDowell? Yes. 12 yes. The record shows that's passed unanimously. Um, now, before we go to the next section, I just want to do a little housekeeping. I think if we uh, hold our questions until the co-chair has made the motion, and then you can make the questions on the motion. Is that uh, acceptable to everybody? That'll maybe speed us up a bit. Okay. Uh, Mike Morton. Uh, 
So section 72 requires the chief information officer to receive the approval from the Department of Human Resources, Office Management and Budget, and the Controller General's Office before making any changes to the department's employee compensation and verification that funding exists for any changes. Section 73 requires in an effort to maintain consistency that all state agencies or departments to have the consent of the chief information officer, office of the management and budget and the controller general's office prior to changing their IT networking or messaging platforms. Section 74 will be put on hold. Section 75 requires DTI to provide OMB and the Controller General's Office and accounting of direct and indirect charges to state agencies and prior fiscal year revenue received from these charges each September 1st. This section also limits increases in these charges without uh, Office of Management and Budget and Controller General approval. Section 76 prohibits DPI from assessing or providing legislator emails or phone calls to another state agency without consent. That completes our boilerplate epilogue for Department of Technology and Information. If we can go to the next tab, we'll combine the two in the motion. We go to that, other objective is next. Jason. Jason. Am I unmuted now? Okay. We are on the other elective tab, starting with section 77. Section 77 provides that agencies that are responsible for the cost of audits contracted by the auditor of accounts as written into a signed contract, um, so long as the agency was consulted and agreed to the cost prior to the contract being signed. Section 78 uh, provides spending authority for personnel and operational expenses of the cash management policy board. It also states that the state treasurer must seek consent of the board to retain banking and or investment services. And it also provides that any funds under the custody of the state treasurer must be invested consistent with the guidelines of the board as well. Section 79 allows for the office of the state treasurer to have a cost recovery rate for merchant services fees for taking credit, debit, and purchasing cards. Any adjustments to the rate are approved by the office of management and budget. This section further details the process by which the treasurer's office may recover its transaction costs. Section 80 provides that the Office of the State Treasurer, with the assistance of the Department of Technology and Information and the Delaware Government Information Center, must evaluate and approve the payment component of any new web-based technology initiatives involving the electronic written, written web. <laughs> funds coming to the state. <laughs> um, and then section 81. This is the last section. This allows for the plans management board, the Office of the State Treasurer and the Department of Health and Social Services, the Office of Management and Budget, and the Office of the Controller General to explore funding sources to cover the administrative costs of the ABLE program. And that concludes the uh, epilogue for the other elective section. Thank you, Jason. Uh, so I think we'll take those two sections. Mr. Co-Chair, do you make a motion? Under the technology and information tab, I make a motion that we approve section 72, 73, place section 74 on hold, approve 75 and 76. Then moving to the other elective tab, we approve section 77, 78, 79, 80, and 81 as written and presented. Second. Moved and seconded on the motion. Are there any questions on the board? Seeing none, uh, I would call the roll on the motion. Representative Bolden? <laughs> yes. Representative Briggs King? Yes. Representative Carson? Yes. Senator Ennis? Yes. Representative Hensley? Yes. Representative Jakes? Yes. Senator Lawson? Yes. Senator Pardee? Yes. yes. Senator Richardson? Yes. Senator Sturgeon? Yes. Representative Johnson? Yes. yes. Senator McDowell? Yes. Yes. Yes.
12 yes. 12 yes, it is passed unanimously. We can now go to uh, the next session, which is legal. Okay. Back to me. <laughs> So we are on uh, the legal section. This starts with section 82. Uh, section 82 requires that the Department of Justice submit a semi-annual report detailing the number of Deputy Attorney General FTE positions and the source of their funding and the divisions for which they are assigned. Section 83 essentially lays out the appropriation of personnel costs, the number of split funded FTEs, uh, the reimbursement rates, and how they should be applied for the child support services function within the Department of Justice as the state makes the initial expenditures, but is then reimbursed from federal funds that are controlled by DHSS. Section 84 uh, requires DENREC to allocate funding to the Department of Justice for one ASF FTE position by July 15th of each fiscal year. Section 85 appropriates funding to the department for three ASF FTEs for the Consumer Protection Unit uh, for activities associated with the regulation of credit counseling and debt management companies. Section 86, appropriate spending authority to the DOJ for the Victim Compensation Assistance Program and provides reporting requirements. Uh, there are some slight changes here going from a monthly reporting requirement to a semi-monthly. Section 87, uh, established the Criminal Justice Improvement Committee with the intention of recommending improvements, recognizing efficiencies and or cost savings uh, in the criminal justice system. Section 88, appropriates funding and one FTE uh, DAG to the criminal divisions uh, to prosecute cases specific to the Special Victims Unit in either Kent or Sussex County. Section 89 relates to certain positions at the Department of Justice who would not be tenured in that position unless they had been employed by the department for at least 18 months or if they had already achieved tenure prior to the effective date, which is January 3rd, 2014. And the last section here, Section 90, appropriates funding for contractual attorneys for the Office of Conflicts Council uh, and upon approval allows the chief defender and the chief office of conflicts counsel to take certain steps in an effort to maximize recruitment and retention of qualified attorneys for these programs. Mr. Chairman, that is the end of the legal law summary section. section. Jason, and I think we can go to the next section, uh, human resources. I have a question. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think we have a change in section 83. Uh, we have a request from LB on section 83 that we change the 16 on line 5 to 17. Those are the number of positions that are reflected in their budget. 17.0. 17. 17. Correct. Mr. Co-Chair, you have that? Okay, I think we can go to the next. Yes, sir. Is that also you, Jason? That's me. Victoria. Victoria. Oh, there's Victoria. Here she comes. Okay. We are going to start with the human resource tab, page 136. Uh, section 91 authorizes the department to implement a state of Delaware merit employee mediation program. Section 892 deems the Secretary of the Department of Human Resource as the central leadership role for the executive branch over matters such as personnel and labor relations. Section 93 says that any changes to the merit rules through an act of the legislature will be codified in the merit rules by DHR. Section 94, subsection A says the department is authorized to develop talent acquisition and retention initiative programs for hard to fill positions. And subsection B says programs are required to submit quarterly reports on the progress of such programs. Section 95 appropriates 25,000 to support the GEAR Award to recognize or incentivize individuals or groups of state employees who demonstrate innovative, continuous improvement projects with sustainable results. This concludes the Department of Human Resource, FLO. Very well, uh, Mr. Co-Chair. I would like to make a motion that under the legal tab, we approve section 82. On section 83, we have made an edit in line five from 16 split funded to 17 split funded positions. We will then approve eight, section 84, 85, 87, 88, 89, and 90. 
then moving to the human resources tab, we would approve sections 91, 92, 93, 94, and 95 as written and presented. All right, uh, we have a motion made. Do I have a second to the motion? Second. Moved and seconded. Um, any questions on the motion? All those in favor? Uh, no, we can't do it. We'll have to call the roll. Staff, please call the roll. Representative Bolton? Yes. Representative Briggs King? Yes. Representative Carson? Yes. Senator Ennis? Yes. Representative Hensley? Yes. Representative Jakes? Yes. Senator Lawson? Yes. Senator Pardee? Yes. yes. Senator Richardson? Yes. Senator Sturgeon? Yes. Representative Johnson? Yes. Senator McDowell? Yes. 12 yes. 12 yes, let the record reflect, that's passed unanimously. And we go now to the department. All right, Department of State, starting with section 96 on page 138. Section 96 appropriates funds and two exempt FTEs within the Department of State for World Trade Center Delaware and International Council, and also designates the International Development Group as the primary entity for the state related to all international trade matters. Section 97 appropriates funding to the Delaware Heritage Commission and allows $7,000 to be used for scholar awards. Section 98 authorizes ASF for replacement, repair, and refurbishment of historical markers. Section 99 establishes the Technology Infrastructure Fund and corporations to be used for technology and infrastructure expenses for corporations and Department of State projects. Section 100 says that the Delaware Heritage Commission shall investigate books and writings in Delaware history that should be considered for republication. Section 101 authorizes funding for library standards and of that amount, libraries may reserve up to $429,600 for planning and evaluation grants. Section 102 establishes shift differentials for LPNs at the veterans home. Section 103 gives the Department of State the authority to fill vacant positions with qualified applicants at the vet's home through recruitment efforts unless an eligibility list is required by federal law. Section 104 authorizes the State Banking Commissioner to retain $150,000 of the bank franchise tax for costs of collection and administration. Section 105 says the Delaware Economic Development Authority will continue to use revenue from the Blue Collar Training Fund for the Workforce Development Grant. Section 106 appropriates ASF authority for tourism marketing, Calmar Nickel, and National High School Wrestling Tournament to be paid in annual allotments. Section 107 allocates interest earnings of the Delaware Strategic Fund to be used first for general operating expenses of the Division of Small Business, the Small Business Development Center, the Business Marketing Program, and the Delaware Tech Community College IT Learning Center. Section 108 says the state of Delaware through the Tourism Office and the Riverfront Development Corporation may charter the Calmar Nickel at no cost. Section 109 requires the Calmar Nickel Foundation to provide the Division of Small Business, OMB, and the Controller General with financial reports detailing expenditures and revenues. Section 110 authorizes DENREC and DELDOT to engage in a pilot program with the Government Information Center for crowdsourced project solutions. Section 111 appropriates funding for business incubators. Section 112 authorizes the Division of Corporations to administer a delinquent franchise tax collections pilot program. That completes the reading of epilogue for Department of State. All right, thank you. And I think we can also go to finance. Section 113. That's Ruth Ann again. All right, section 113 in Department of Finance authorizes finance to maintain special funds for acquisition of technology and associated costs of computer systems for the department. Section 114 authorizes the Division of Revenue to establish and maintain a special fund to contract and employ personnel for collection of delinquent taxes. Section 115 authorizes the Director of Revenue to accept payment by credit card for taxes and fees. 
Section 116 authorizes the Secretary of Finance to enter into agreements and maintain an account regarding property to be sheeted to the states or identified abandoned property. Section 117 states that if the contractual services amount for the state lottery office exceeds the amount in section one due to increased ticket or lottery sales, the spending authority may be amended by the Secretary of Finance, Director of OMB, and the Controller General. Section 118 requires state lottery funds to be released to an established account in DHSS substance abuse and mental health. Section 119 authorizes the state lottery office to enter into an agreement with other state lotteries for multi-jurisdictional video lottery games. That completes the epilogue for finance. Thank you, Dan. We'll go to the co-chair for for a uh, motion. Thank you. I make a motion that under the section uh, Department of State, we approve sections 96, 97, 98, 99, 100, 101, 102, 103, 104, 105, 106, 107, 108, 109, 110, 111, 112 as written and presented. And then we also add to the motion under the tab Department of Finance approved sections 113, 114, 115, 116, 117, 118, and 119 as written and presented. Second. Second, thank you. Uh, let's see, Mayor staff, would you please call the roll? On, uh, we have a question. I'm sorry, we have a question, question on the motion. Re- Representative Yes, Briggs. thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to bring attention and maybe place on hold until I get the answer. I believe it was section 112, um, where a section, I'm sorry, 111, where it refers to the um, the incubator money that's going out to to Newcastle um, County to Kent Economic Development, because I do believe this year that Sussex County um, applied for that um, after this controversy last year. So I want to see why um, they're not included in, and maybe have this on hold till I get that answer. One, one, one. Was there first uh, an answer or we need time? Time. Uh, the motion will be amended to put section 111 uh, in the Department of State on hold. Okay, none, all those, uh, let's have the roll call of staff, please. Senator Bolden? Yes. Representative Briggs King? Yes. Representative Carson? Yes. Senator Annis? Yes. Representative Hensley? Yes. Representative Jakes? Yes. Senator Lawson? Yes. Senator Pardee? Yes. yes. Senator Richardson? Yes. Senator Sturgeon? Yes. Representative Johnson? Yes. Senator McDowell? Yes. 12 yes. Health, health and social services is uh, starting with section 120, and that's uh, Victoria. Okay, we're going to be on page 146, health and social services, uh, beginning with section 120. 120 authorizes the department to fill vacant direct service positions through agency recruitment efforts. Section 121 appropriates funding for a home and community-based ombudsman to provide conflict resolution. Uh, This epilogue changes split funding of 0.5 FTE and 0.5 NSF to a full 1.0 FTE. Section 122, subsection A, discusses the investigations conducted by the Audit and Recovery Management Services concerning public welfare and purchasive care programs, overpayments and fraud. Subsection B appropriates funds for the operations of the arms unit through collection efforts. Section 123 appropriates the cross department resources for children ages birth to three and defines interagency resource management committee. Funding provides service coordination transition services for this population. 
Uh, there was a strike through changing funding from 6,509.1 to 8,878.5 uh, through subsection C, uh, saying 150 of the allocation for the birth to three program is to provide evaluation and direct services to children. Section 124, subsection A, appropriates funding totally 1,980.2 to support the Delaware Institute of Medical Education and Research, DIMER. Subsection B, changes in allocation must be approved by OMB and the CGO's office. And subsection C says scholarships will be coordinated through the Healthcare Commission. Section 125, subsection A, appropriates funds of 200 to support the Delaware Institute of Dental Education and Research, DITER. Subsection B, scholarships will be coordinated through the Healthcare Commission. Section 126, subsection A, appropriates 198.4 to the Dimer Loan Repayment Program. Subsection B requires the Healthcare Commission to coordinate the terms and conditions of repayment. The allocation shall be used to recruit physicians or other practitioners eligible under the Loan Repayment Program and to recruit and retain practitioners in underserved areas of Delaware. Section 127, subsection A, appropriate 17.5 to the DITER loan repayment program. Subsection B requires the Healthcare Commission to coordinate the terms. The allocation shall be used to recruit physicians or other practitioners eligible under the program and to recruit practitioners in underserved areas of Delaware. Uh, section 128 will be placed on hold. Section 129 authorizes DHSS to contract for a multi-state purchasing alliance for the procurement of pharmaceutical products, services, and al uh, allied supplies. Section 130, subsection A, allows for Medicaid appropriation and spending authority for the program. Subsection B authorizes use of appropriated funds. And subsection C says that Medicaid funds can be expended if the program is approved and federal matching requirements are met, except that funds may be used to cover mental health conditions. Subsection D says a report is due May 15th each year detailing all services under the Medicaid appropriation. Section 131, subsection A, appropriates funds to DMMA for programs paying for health care and establishes drug rebate process for its clients. Subsection B, authorizes DMMA to work with other state agencies to develop additional drug rebate programs for programs with appropriations to purchase drugs. And subsection C says OMB and DHSS, in conjunction with the CGO and JFC co-chairs, will continue to work to address cost containment initiatives. Section 132 allows managed care services to be procured by the Delaware Medical Assistance Program. State procurement requirements do not apply to these contracts. Section 133 appropriates tobacco funds for renal disease, money support staffing of chronic renal disease advisory committee, assisting in the development of programs, initiatives, and educational programs. Section 134 authorizes AFSF spending authority to deposit federal share Medicaid reimbursement for the Pathways Program Employment Navigators, focusing on employing people with disabilities to cover the state share of claims for pathway services. Section 135 authorizes 2.0 FTE Medicaid eligibility specialists to coordinate and expedite the Medicaid eligibility application process. Section 136 appropriates 539.5 to tobacco fund contractual services to provide non-public school nursing five days a week in Newcastle and Kent counties. Section 137, subsections A through E outline the responsibilities of the Office of Animal Welfare, including staffing requirements, enforcement of animal control and animal cruelty laws and payment structure. Section 138 appropriates general funds and tobacco funds for the uninsured action plan. These funds will be used to continue services provided under the plan and after all available funds for this purpose have been exhausted. Section 139 appropriates general fund and tobacco funds to provide flu, pneumonia, hepatitis B and other vaccinations and associated supplies for Delawareans who do not have insurance or coverage. And section 140 appropriates funding for specific costs to the environmental toxicology and emergency response branch. Section 141, subsection A, provides funds to administer the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund for technical assistance and water operator training for drinking water systems. Subsection B, with approval of OMB and CGO, an RFP may be issued for water system technical assistance. Section 142, appropriates funds to both community health and judicial to improve birth outcomes and reduce infant mortality. These funds are to be used to implement recommendations of the Infant Mortality Task Force. And Delaware Healthy Mother and Infant Consortium. 
Section 143 requires 20,000 received from state lottery funds to be used to provide an addiction prevention program in all Delaware high schools to address compulsive gambling. Section 141 says that DSAM is authorized with approval to reallocate resources to encourage appropriate services and treatment for persons with mental illness. Section 145 appropriates funding to support clients in the least restrictive settings and tr transition residents of DPC into the community. Section 146 allows for specific positions supporting DPC to receive standby pay and or callback pay to remain competitive in staffing. Section 147 appropriates funding of assigned dollars for a direct patient care education program to enable direct care professionals to take courses to increase their skills in specialty areas. Participants will provide clinical services with compensation to the Delaware Psychiatric Center during the dura duration of their education. Section 148 appropriates funds for the substance use disorder services to allow substance exposed pregnant women priority in the placement to the extent allowable under federal guidelines. Section 149 appropriates funds allowing the division to collect and deposit funds into this appropriation for the recovery of TANF child support pass through costs. It also adds the ability of social services to retain payments of TANF clients based on the assignment of rights, which is a condition of eligibility. Section 150 with approval from OMB and CGO, social services is authorized to make policy changes in TANF and child care development block grant programs to ensure that Delaware will qualify for the full federal block grant entitlement funds. Section 151, subsection A provides funds and positions to visually impaired to allow itinerant teachers to make caseload requirements. And subsection B provides the authority to meet the needs of an IEP plan for visually impaired students. Section 152 appropriates 15.9 to compensate DOC offenders for the production of rail materials. Section 153 provides an appropriation in child support services to support operations of the division. Revenue from child support collections will fund child support programs and related staff. Section 154 provides an appropriation in child support services to maintain and operate the Delaware child support system and, dis and disbursement. Section 155 allows developmental disability services to retain revenue collected above the first 350 deposited annually Medicaid reimbursement to cover costs associated with case management services. Section 156, subsection A, appropriates funds to provide door-to-door -door transportation to and from day service providers for eligible clients. DDDS will maintain FY13 rates and will implement an add-on rate to support door-to-door -door transportation for pre-vocational and day habilitation services. Subsection B says of the appropriation, 300 is to be used to support providers for the cost of providing paratransit tickets. Providers must submit funding needs by September 1st, and the department provides an allocation plan by September 30th each year. Section 157 allows de developmental disability services to allocate resources to maximize community-based residential placement. These initiatives must not compromise care for the remaining Stokely population. Section 158 requires DHSS to submit for approval from joint finance prior to pursuing systems of managed long-term services and supports for the intellectual and developmental disability community. Section 159 provides funds for the purchase of care community services, allows for DDDS to maintain revenues collected to support DDDS community clients. Section 160, appropriation of 182.2 to support the services of the Delaware Helpline, a spending plan and expenditures is due by August 31st of each year. Section 161 appropriates funds to reimburse emergency shelters and code purple sanctuaries for operational cost supplies and or equipment. And lastly, section 162 allows aging adults with physical disabilities to reallocate resources with the approval of OMB and CGO to create equities of service and treatment between the Hospital for the Chronically Ill, Governor Bacon, and community-based services for persons aging and or with physical disabilities. That concludes the epilogue for DHSS. Victoria, what was the last section number you read? Section 162. I have a few more than that. Yeah. Oh, yep, we'll continue. <laughs> Section 163 defines the, lo or defines the lo logistics of funding for the PROMISE program through DMMA and DSAM appropriations. 
164 appropriates tobacco funds for respite care for aging and adults with physical disabilities. Section 165 allows DSAPID DHCI to collect and deposit funds as a result of revenue generated from pharmaceuticals associated with hospice services. 166 says that all non-state agencies who employees are required to receive criminal background checks must provide DHSS with quarterly reports of all employees hired. DHSS will re review these reports to ensure compliance. And now lastly, 167, services and billing practices for generating and retaining revenue at DPC will be reviewed by the department. If in the event of declining disproportionate share hospital funds, the division will submit a plan for approval to retain revenue to sustain operations at current levels. Thank you, Maria. Mr. Chairman, I think that's long enough to stand on its own. I make a motion that we approve under the health and social services tab, sections 120 all the way through tabs one, sections 167 as written and presented. Second. Yep, second. 128 what? Is on hold. With 128 being on hold. Motion is so amended. Is there a second? Uh, Moved and seconded. Uh, any question on the motion? One question, Senator. On uh, section 139, uh, not because it does state this is, has to deal with the vaccines. And obviously, right now, there is no vaccine for COVID 19, but it is uh, grouped into that because it says and other necessary vaccinations. Uh, just to state that we probably, for one, if there is a vaccination that's COVID-19, it's not part of our budget, that would qualify for the CARES Act funding, correct? And then, and then certainly, if we all ultimately uh, go past, because the CARES Act is actually through the end of this year at this moment, and obviously if we're now into the spring of 2021 when a vaccine is available, those funds would still be eligible to utilize towards that vaccine, even if there isn't or is any federal assistance. So just not necessarily a question pointing that out because of the climate that we're in. So you're, you're saying you're satisfied that those needs will be covered by these motions, these uh, items in the effort? Yes, I, I was trying for the public just to make sure since COVID-19 wasn't specifically mentioned in that, uh, it is covered. It would be looped into that. We don't have to worry about our own budget at this point in time because it's all part of the CARES Act. And if it goes past the calendar year into the next uh, calendar year, then we will also have to just address those. But there will be not an issue if a vaccine is developed and us being able to provide it. So, no. uh, so we have a motion before us, seconded. Any further questions on the motion? Seeing none, uh, we'll call the roll, please, for the for this motion. Representative Bolden? Yes. Representative Briggs King? Yes. Representative Carson? Yes. Senator Ennis? Yes. Representative Hensley? Yes. Senator Jakes? Yes. Senator Lawson? Yes. Senator Pardee? Yes. yes. Senator Richardson? Yes. Senator Sturgeon? Yes. Representative Johnson? Yes. Senator McDowell? Yes. 12 yes. 12 yes, let the record reflect. This is passed unanimously. And uh, we can now go to Victoria again for services for children, youth, and their families. We're going to begin on page 160 with section 168. Section 168 allows the department to make proposals with cost estimates to enhance or develop services provided by the state. Section 169 says one additional exempt position is allowed in the Division of Management Support Services. Section 170 appropriates funds to prevention and behavioral health to provide treatment to youth, including those referred through drug court. 
Section 171 appropriates funds to provide early intervention services through the Family Crisis Therapist Program intended for grades six through five or K through five. Section 172 appropriates funds to work with the Richardson Park Learning Center to provide intensive mental and behavioral health management to improve academic performance through a contractual licensed therapist. Section 173, subsection A, appropriates funds for after-school programs focused on youth violence and child suicide prevention. Subsection B, appropriates funding to prevention, early, prevention and early intervention for in-school, middle school behavioral health services. An annual report, including the number of clients and expenditures, shall be submitted to the JFC, the Director of OMB, and the Controller General by May 1st. Section 174 appropriates funds to youth rehabilitative services for contractual services or the statewide availability of the Juvenile Offender Civil Citation Program. Section 175, subsection A, requires a quarterly report submission from secure care detailing casual seasonal and overtime expenditures for Ferris School, Newcastle County Detention, and Stevenson House. Subsection B requires a quarterly report detailing the status of Stevenson House in Milford. Section 176 appropriates funds to family services to limit the number of children remaining in foster care for more than two years. Annual report of the number of youth must be submitted by October 1st of each year. Section 177 authorizes additional training positions for training investigative and treatment workers in family services. Section 178 allows the director of the OMB to reduce personnel through attrition if the quarterly average daily population or ADP drops below 114 individuals. Section 179 appropriates funds to support contracted caseworker staff responsible for the completion of plans of safe care. Section 180 provides authority to establish we need to change 39.0 to reflect 50.0 FTEs to address statutory caseload compliance with the approval of OMB and CGO. What line number, please? It would be... 20. Line 20. So 39 to 50. And then section 181 appropriates funds and positions and authorizes NSF positions with the movement of the Office of Child Care Licensing to the Department of Education beginning July of 2020. And that concludes the epilogue for services for children, youth, and their families. Uh, we can go ahead and add to this the correction. Yes, sir. I make a motion under this section, services for children, youth, and their families, that we approve sections 168, 169, 170, 171, 172, 173, 174, 175, 176, 177, 178, 179, and on section 180 with an edit of on line 20 from 39 to 50 full-time equivalents and section 181, all is written and presented. Um, Hold. I'd like to put section 170 on hold. There's a question been asked by Representative Bolden. I amend the motion, the motion to put one section, section 170 on hold. You also have a request for 181 to be placed on hold. Uh, I amend the motion, all sections from 168 to 181 
with section 170 and 181 on hold to be approved as written and presented. Second. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a question is section 173, just for clarification, uh, section B of 173. Uh, have we or did we receive a report? It says the controller would receive a report by May 1st each year in JFC. Due to the virus, uh, have we been able or has this report been done? Representative, we would have to double check with the agency and ensure whether or not we got it. I don't, I don't remember seeing it, but that doesn't mean they haven't submitted it. So we'll jump, we'll double check. The Briggs King. Okay. Thank you. I just had a question on that section as well. Um, on line one is if we can have a definition of targeted prevention programs. I, I think I understand what it means, but I'm not sure because that's that's new language. The targeted prevention program. Can we go to corrections uh, to add to this motion? All right, we'll split the motion. Is that okay. Yes, yes, sir. So we will be uh, looking at correction section 182. And section 182 appropriates funding for staff training relief officer positions to be used for training relief of officers in various facilities. Also, it details quarterly reporting requirements. And this section also appropriates 20 new positions or 20 cadets or 20 positions for new cadets rather uh, to be able to complete the required correctional employee initial training. Uh, Section 183 allows the department to contract out health care services to the department's incarcerated population and provides uh, for the ability to be able to utilize an emergency procurement clause subject uh, to approval. Section 184 requires the department to submit a semi-annual report relating to bilingual medical services. Section 185 provides an appropriation for the prison arts program, which is currently in operation at James T. Vaughan Correctional Center. Section 186 uh, provides an appropriation for the collection of DNA samples, which are collected in accordance with Delaware Code. Section 187 provides an appropriation in one F FTE responsible for the oversight of the program that manufactures reading materials and braille for the visually impaired. Section 188 provides an appropriation to support contractual drug and alcohol treatment programs to those in custody or in supervision of the department. It also details reporting requirements surrounding the submission of a spending plan for the funds and directs the commissioner and the secretary of DHSS to develop RFPs for contracts uh, to provide for behavioral health services, including mental health and substance use disorder treatment. Section 189 provides an appropriation to community corrections, probation, and parole, and requires an annual report that details uh, the expenditure of personnel costs uh, by SENTAC level, which ranges from zero to four, five, I believe. Section 190 uh, requires that the Bureau of Community Corrections utilize a minimum of 10 FTE positions to continue existing highway beautification projects, as well as contains a contractual service appropriation to Kent County Community Corrections. Section 191 essentially requires the submission of a quarterly overtime expenditure report and outlines the expectations of data contained within that report. Section 192 relates to prison, ed prison education services and provides that all teaching positions related to prison education are managed by the Department of Education. And essentially this section contains language that outlines the process in place for when a Department of Correction teacher wishes to transfer or applies for and is accepted to the Department of Education position. Section 193 requires that the Bureau of Community Corrections, Probation and Parole arrange 24 seven coverage over supervision of vendors and further outlines that the ratio of probation officer one positions not exceed 50% during night and weekend hours. Section 194 uh, provides 
that department employees designated as correctional emergency response or CERT team members and the correctional security superintendent uh, slash chief of security and inspections shall be eligible for standby pay. Uh, this year, additional language has been added that specifies that certain employees in FLS and FLSA exempt positions are uh, eligible for straight time overtime pay if activated to work beyond their respective work schedule uh, by the warden of special operations or a higher authority. Section 195 allows the department to review the security status classification of its facilities and submit a request for approval uh, if the department produces any security level changes. Section 196 appropriates funding to the Medical Treatment and Services Unit for the management and oversight of medical care to offenders and outlines a number of reporting requirements related to the administration of healthcare services. Section 197 appropriates funding for a community reintegration services program administered by the Delaware Center for Justice in Newcastle County. Section 198 provides that DOC staff lieutenants and correctional captains who are not covered by the Fair Labor Standards Act are entitled to receive compensation at the regular rate of pay for all approved overtime services beyond 40 hour or week. Um, this year, additional language has been added that would include correctional officer youth rehab food service director one and two positions in this section. Section 199 appropriates funding to support program offerings such as substance abuse treatment and anger management for the youthful criminal offender program for the juvenile male population, which is now at Howard R. Young Correctional Institution. Uh, section 200 would allow the department upon approval and if there is revenue to support it to expand its Delaware Correctional Industries program in level four and five facilities. Uh, further, the Secretary of Human Resources is also authorized to increase the ASF personnel complement, complement if the program is uh, expanded. Section 201 allows the department upon approval to reallocate vacant positions to address immediate operational needs. And lastly, Section 202 is a new section of epilogue with language that provides uh, any DOC employee that is designated as a critical incident stress management team member that is not covered under the Fair Labor Standards Act to be entitled to straight time pay or straight time pay rate for all approved overtime services and shall be eligible for standby and callback pay when activated. That concludes the reading of the epilog for the Department of Correction. Thank you, Justin. Uh, what, what I'd like to do here is uh, the co-chair can either make a, an amendment to the original motion or make a whole new motion and then we combine the two together in the roll call vote. Mr. Co-chair. Make a motion that we approve, well now I don't have what was on hold for 116 through 180. Hold on. Start with 182. Yeah, sections under the corrections tab, sections 182 through 202 approved as submitted and presented. Second. Move the second. Uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, the number one was uh, DCYF, and now we're adding corrections and put the two together two motions together uh, and take a vote on that combined. If that's with, with no objection, we'll do it that way. Uh, can we have staff call the roll? Oh, I have a, Senator Lawson, I'm sorry. Mr. Chair, I have an objection to that. I think there's too much confusion on the first section that we probably ought to do them separately because we don't know if 173 is on hold 170, 181, I don't know. So could we clarify that before we move further? Try the motion that was Mr. Chair. 
Yes, sir. You're continually being muted and we can't hear you. I try to deal with that. Space, sometimes the space bar doesn't work. Sometimes I don't work. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Let's, let's just take a motion. But, but, one two kids. Yeah. We, we have kids in a motion before us that it, that had, passed, that had not had passed, hadn't been voted on. It had been seconded. A motion to that had been seconded. Um, Mr. Co-Chairman, could you remake the motion for the kids department, DCYF? Gladly, but before I make the motion, get a clarification on section 173. I think that was Representative Ruth, Ruth Briggs King. You had questions on that. Do you want it on hold or are you satisfied? Prevention programs. So we're going to leave it in. We're going to leave it in. Okay. So services for children, sections 168, 169. We're putting on hold section 170. Approving 171, 72, 73, 74, 175, 176, 177, 178, 179, 180, and putting 181 on hold. And section 180 is edited uh, in line 20 from 39 to 50. Then moving to the Department of Corrections, sections 182 all the way through section 202, all approved as presented and written. And a motion. There's a motion before us, is there a second? Second. Right, uh, would you step on the motion before us? The bold. Thank you, I have a question. Bye. Mute. Okay. All right. How do you get to stay on mute? On and section one ninety nine. Just a technical question. Uh, on line twenty seven, uh, the last part where it, it's indicating that funds shall be used for um, for supporting the youthful. Correctional Offenders Program or or used to support or either for supporting. The way it's here right now, it says used to supporting. So it should be used to support. Or for, I mean, it's just a technical. For, for representative. I one. Right. The, the way I, I see it, the ING is actually stricken. It's so stricken. It, written as it does used read to used to support. That's the way it's. That's the way it reads. There, it's the way it's written. The IEG is crossed out. Okay. 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 You good, Representative? There are no further questions on the motion, and uh, the staff will call the roll. Representative Bolden? Yes. Representative Briggs King? Yes. Representative Carson? Yes. Senator Ennis? Yes. Representative Hensley? Yes. Representative Jakes? Yes. These things keep falling. Senator Lawson? Yes. Senator Pardee? Yes. yes. Senator Richardson? Yes. Senator Sturgeon? Yes. Representative Johnson? Yes. Senator McDowell? Yes. 12 yes. Let's
Go to Dan Rack for now. Oh boy. Okay, thank you. So for Denrec, section 203 dedicates one enforcement coordinator position in community services to be merit exempt, which is funded through recoveries of enforcement actions, which is penalty funds. Section 204 authorizes Denrec to carry forward boat registration fee collections to support fisheries programs and marine enforcement. Section 205 authorizes 0.5 FTE Ombudsman uh, James Brunswick to be funded through the Community Environmental Project Fund. Section 206 authorizes the Division of Fish and Wildlife to spend AF ASF revenues collected. ASF revenues may also be used for capital expenditures in accordance with the Capital Development Plan submitted annually to the legislature. Any deviations from the plan must be approved by the Director of Office of Management and Budget and the Controller General. Section 207 appropriates ASF funds for an enforcement vehicle and interpretive program for vehicle at Hillens Pond State Park. Section 208 appropriates ASF funds for casual seasonal positions at Hillens Pond Water Park and program and contractual services at Bellevue State Park. Section 209 appropriates ASF funds for promotions and programs at Trap Pond State Park. Section 210 appropriates park ASF funds for monument and maintenance of Wilmington Parks, War Memorials, and Ball Fields. Section 211 appropriates one conservation technician three to be dedicated to the Brandywine Zoo and Wilmington State Parks. Section 212 appropriates $180,000 of general funds in the Division of Watershed Stewardship to be used for personnel for the preparation of nutrient management plans, also manure management. Section 213 appropriates $1,000 of general funds in the Division of Water to be set aside for the Environmental Science Scholarship Program. Section 214 appropriates one ASF engineer to be assigned to the Delaware City Petrochemical Complex to respond to complaints regarding air quality. The position must submit an annual report to JFC by February 1st of each year summarizing activities. Section 215 requires NREC to submit a report every two years by October 1st on the revenue sufficiency of fee collecting programs. This section also requires that any changes in fees must be approved by the General Assembly as part of DENREC's annual budget submittal. Section 216 authorizes four exempt positions from the Merit System Administrative Management positions within DENREC. Section 217 requires DENREC to submit an annual report on the weatherization assistance program to OMB and the Controller General by June 15th. Section 218 allows up to $5,000 of the tire cleanup funds to be used for cleanup of small tire piles. Section 219 authorizes Office of Environmental Protection Waste and Hazardous Substance to utilize $292,100 ASF from the Scrap Tire Management Fund for costs associated with the Solid Waste Program. And that finalizes the Denrec epilogue. 203 through 219. All right, thank you very much. I'd like to put section 210. Oh, Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we will be starting on <coughs> Section 220 for Safety and Homeland Security, and Section 220 uh, provides ASF spending authority relating to an agreement between Sussex County Council and the Delaware State Police, which essentially outlines a 50-50 split of the cost for 44 troopers authorized for Sussex County. Section 221 requires the department to submit a quarterly report detailing all incoming asset seizure shared funds 
and the related plan for the expenditure of those funds. Section 222 appropriates funding and provides for 20 positions to the Delaware State Police for the purpose of training state police recruits. Um, additional positions can be authorized by the Director of um, Office of Management and Budget as needed. Section 223 allows the department in essence to rent space on telecommunications towers under state police administration to private telecommunication companies um, and details how revenues from this should be treated. Section 224 requires the department to submit a quarterly report detailing overtime expenditures related to Capitol Police and outlines the information which should be included. Section 225 appropriates funding and provides two FTEs uh, for traffic light enforcement, which is funded from revenues generated by the red light uh, enforcement safety program from the Department of Transportation. Section 226 appropriates funding to the Developmental Disabilities Council for the Partners in Policy Making Program. Section 227 relates to the ASF appropriation of personnel and operating costs associated with the Truck Enforcement Unit, which is funded through the Department of Transportation. Section 228 relates to the E911 Emergency Reporting System Fund and uh, related reporting requirements. Section 229 provides ASF spending authority for expenses related to meals for recruits at the State Police Academy. Section 230 provides ASF spending authority related to the recovery of costs associated with patrol services at the State Fair. Section 231 provides an ASF appropriation for two ASF FTEs resulting from revenue generated by DUI conviction fees, with the remaining revenue being deposited into the general fund. Section 232 provides an, appropriate, an ASF appropriation for two ASF FTEs uh, resulting from revenue generated from the sex offender registry fee. Section 233 appropriates funding for three FTE positions to support firearm investigations uh, within DSP and D. Section 234 relates to an ASF appropriation for the fund to, fund to combat violent crime. It outlines requirements for how the funding should be used and establishes a process for which spending authority may be amended if there is a need to do so. And lastly, this uh, Section 235 appropriates funding to the Wilmington Police Department and the Newcastle County Police Departments to assist with DNA testing and other related expenses for the investigation of open cold cases. Mr. Chairman, that completes uh, the reading of the epilogue for the Department of Safety and Homeland Security. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Mr. Co-Chair, do we have a motion? I make a motion under the Natural Resource tab that sections 203 to 209 be approved as written and presented. We're gonna put section 210 on hold, then sections 211 through 219 as written and presented. Moving over to the next tab, safety and homeland security, approving sections 220 through 235 as written and presented. And a motion. I have a motion before us to have a second. Second. I have a second. Um, okay. Uh, let's have a roll call call by staff. Yes. A question on the motion. Representative Jakes. Motion. Question on the motion. Uh, Senator Lawson. Yes, sir. Section 214, a full-time engineer purely to handle the complaints from that entity. What is the salary of that engineer? I don't know. Do we have any the salary of that engineer? Certainly is a reasonable question. I can get that information for you, Senator. That will be fine. Thank you. Who said that? Who said that? Victoria. Okay. All right. We have that on hold, sir.
Representative Bolden. Representative, yes. Representative Briggs King. Yes. Representative Carson. Yes. Senator Ennis. Yes. Representative Hensley. Yes. Representative Jakes. Yes. Senator Lawson. Yes. Senator Pardee. Yes. Senator Richardson. Yes. Senator Sturgeon. Yes. Representative Johnson. Yes. Senator McDowell. Yes. 12 yes. Yes, let the record reflect that's unanimous. Transportation. Did you get it? Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. Transportation. Transportation is Miss Julie. Okay, thank you. Section 236 provides instruction on how the Delaware Transportation Authority budget shall be expended, which includes that debt service estimates must be for current project financing. Newark transportation funding is to cover the city of Newark transportation system. Kent and Sussex services are for transportation of the elderly and disabled in Kent and Sussex counties and include funds for the Sussex County reimbursable program. This section also allows for contracting taxi services run by nonprofits and senior centers, dictates that funds may not be provided to local governments, restricting passengers due to residential requirements and allowing funds to be used to transport dialysis patients in all three counties. Section 237 states that of section authority that authorizes Kent and Sussex counties to provide transportation to the elderly and disabled, $50,000 is appropriated directly to the Modern Maturity Center in Dover and $50,000 to Sussex Cheer Center. Section 238 appropriates $100,000 TFO, Transportation Fund Operating, to be allocated to the Maritime Exchange for the Delaware River and Bay. Section 239 states that DelDOT or EasyPass will not collect any speed data from the high-speed EasyPass link in order to issue traffic tickets. Section 240 authorizes $10 million for snowstorm snow contingency. Any unused authority can carry over from year to year. In addition, the department is authorized to transfer funds to divisions on an as-needed basis. The department may transfer funds to municipalities and other qualified entities to reimburse them pursuant to contracts entered by the department and the municipality to keep transit routes open during snow and storm emergencies. Account activity reports are due quarterly. Section 241 prevents the department from making changes to the rules about the placement of pipe for utility channels. Section 242 allows the Delaware Transit Corporation employees who participated in the state employee ban pool program as of March 1st, 1st, 2007 to continue participation and provides parameters necessary for continued participation. Section 243 provides for existing church, school, or fire department signs currently within 25 feet of the right-of-way line of any public highway to update their existing signs with newer ones. Section 244 provides for all continuing prior year authorization to be transferred to one prior year operations appropriation and requires approval of Office of Management and Budget and Controller General prior to expenditure of prior year funds. One prior year operations appropriation is then placed on the continuing list in lieu of having multiple appropriations on the list. Section 245 requires a portion of maintenance and operations funding and casual seasonal positions to be used for staffing the Smyrna Rest Up Visitor Center. And finally, Section 246 suspends Delaware code relating to the commuter benefit program. The program allowed a stipend for state employees riding the van pool. And that is Dot epilogue descriptions for sections 236 through 246. All right. 
And if we can go to labor, Julie. Section 247 allocates funding and guidelines for summer youth programs in the city of Wilmington, Newcastle County, Kent County, and Sussex County. Section 248 allocates $560,700 in funding to the department's supported employment program, which works to secure employment opportunities for individuals with significant disabilities. Section 249 allocates $630,000 for the workforce development program, which facilitates matching Delaware industry employment needs with educational institutions to fill those needs. Section 250 requires that three FTE and $402,000 appropriated to the Employment and Training Division support the apprenticeship and training program. And finally, Section 251 appropriates $500,000 to Employment and Training Services for creation of the Learning for Careers program. The program's fund shall be used by the Delaware Workforce Development Board to engage employer groups chambers, and associations in creating paid work experiences for youth. The purpose of the program is to expand employer participation in youth employment programs in addition to increasing the number of youth served through summer youth employment programs, secondary school, work-based learning, and cooperative education programs, and post-secondary work-based learning and clinical experiential learning programs. And that is all for Department of Labor sections 247 through 251. Let's go, go forward with agriculture. Thank you. Section 252 appropriates nearly 490 thousand dollars for the University of Delaware Poultry Disease Research and Diagnostic Program to test Delaware's avian flock for infectious diseases. Section 253 appropriates just over $508,000 to the Ag Lands Program for operating expenses. Section 254 appropriates $100,000 ASF. $25,000 be used for marketing ag products and commodities and $75,000 for forestry cost share programs such as urban forestry and rural forestry programs. Section 255 establishes funding to allow the Harness Racing Commission and the Thoroughbred Racing Commission for fingerprinting. Section 256 makes an appropriation from the video lottery proceeds to the Thoroughbred Racing Commission to fund the operating expenses of the commission. 257 makes an appropriation to the video lottery proceeds to, from the video lottery proceeds to the Harness Racing Commission to fund the operating expenses of the commission. And that wraps up sections 252 through 257 for agriculture. Yes, sir. I'd, I'd like a motion under I'd like to make a motion that under the Department Transportation uh, sections 236 through 246 that we approve as written and presented under labor sections 247 through 251 as written and presented and under agriculture section 252 through 257 as written and presented in the motion. I have a motion, it's moved and it's been seconded. Seconded. Yeah. Are there any questions on the motion? Senator Lawson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to put 247 on hold. 247. What, uh, what line? Labor. Labor. Page 180. Okay.
Yes. Any further questions on the motion? Uh, Bruce, Representative Bruce Briggs King. I, I was saying that, can you hear me now? Um, I was glad that the one section placed on hold uh, because I have a question and that's when we look at the last section on natural resources and seasonal and summer help. And then we look at this section on a summer youth program. Um, just don't know if we're gonna be having those programs or not, if that was taken in consideration in other parts of the budget, Bob, because why would we be, um, yes, we want it in there, it's important, but if we're not actually having it this year, then I would, it's something I think might revert back to the, to the fund as an expenditure. So that was a question I have particularly to a couple of these things that we normally fund these programs, but if they're not running or if the parks aren't open for normal things, um, would we, you know, would we be foregoing that and that would be money that would be reverting to the general fund? It's just a question I had. Thank you. Further questions on the motion? All right, seeing none, can uh, staff call, call the roll? Representative Bolton? Yes. Representative Briggs King? Yes. Representative Carson? Yes. Senator Ennis? Yes. Representative Hensley? Yes. Representative Jakes? Yes. Senator Lawson? Yes. Senator Pardee? Yes. Senator Richardson? Yes. Senator Sturgeon? Yes. Representative Johnson? Yes. Senator McDowell? Yes. 12, yes. The next, it's passed unanimously, and we'll now go to elections, followed by national goal. Thank you. So section 258 for the Department of Elections authorizes the Board of Elections to form combined election districts and clerks required for each. Section 259 ensures that the election commissioner utilizes funds within the line item voter purging for the purpose of properly maintaining voter rolls. Section 260 establishes a Rental fee for the designation of polling places for primary, general, and special elections. Section 261 prohibits any state agency, office, or department from publishing or funding voter guides. Section 262 describes poll worker compensation and deductions through uh, FIRST or FSF. Section 263 describes the process the election commissioner must follow to replace signature cards and poll lists. And that is it for Department of Elections, sections 258 through 263. We go through. Uh... Okay, National Guard begins with section 264. Section 264 appropriates funds to cover energy expenses of the school building not directly attributed to the Delaware National Guard. And Section 265, subsection A, appropriates funds for educational assistance. Subsection B states that excess monies may fund recruitment programs. This concludes the epilogue for Delaware National Guard. All right. Uh uh, that uh, we have a uh, uh, Mr. Co Chair, can we have a motion? I make a motion that under the Department of Elections, we approve sections 258 through 263 as written and presented, and then under the tab National Guard, that we approve sections 264 and 265 as written and presented in the motion. Okay. We have a motion before us. It's already been seconded. Uh, are there any questions on the motion? Would you please call the roll for these two? Uh, Representative Bolton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a question uh, regarding the upcoming election. Uh, will we be doing mail-in ballots 
Uh, is that something that would need to be added here since we don't know how they're going to, what we're going to be doing with that? Can I answer that question? Everybody, Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, since the bill, to my understanding, it's not been officially presented, but is only going to be related to this presidential election and this election coming up, that that will qualify it for CARES Act funding. Um, and then moving forward, we would have to take another legislative action to make it effective for subsequent uh, election cycles. And then at that point in time, it would have to be a line item in our budget. So this year, we're it if that measure passes. All right. Thank you. Good question. Good question. All right, we have no further questions before us. All that, can we have the roll call? Hold on, wait a minute. Time out. Uh, let's go ahead with higher education. That's a long one. We've already had a motion in a second, so. Representative Bolton? Yes. Representative Briggs King? Yes. Representative Carson? Yes, yes. Senator Ennis? Yes. Representative Hensley? Yes. Representative Jakes? Yes. Senator Lawson? Yes. Senator Party? Yes. Senator Richardson? Yes. Senator Sturgeon? Yes. Representative Johnson? Yes. Senator McDowell? Yes. 12 yes. Oh, so that previous motion is passed unanimously and we're gonna to go to higher education and that is Ruth. Ruth. All right, higher education, starting with section 266 on page 186. Section 266 appropriates funds for operations at University of Delaware and the Delaware Geological Survey. Section 267 appropriates funds for the College of Agricultural and Natural Resources at U of D to be used for ag extension agents. Section 268 would like to be placed on hold. Section 269 allocates funds for certain programs at UD and requires an annual report of the programs to OMB and Controller General by September 30th. Section 270 allocates funding for the College of Education and Human Development at U of D to provide advisement for student teachers in Kent and Sussex counties. Section 271 allocates funding within U of D for support of the Just-in-Time Parenting Program. Section 272 allocates funding within U of D for the support of the Women's Leadership Program. Section 273 allocates scholarship funding in Dell State for high ability students, achievers in sciences, teaching programs, and female athletes. Section 274 authorizes Dell State to use certain accounting procedures to reduce the administrative burden. <laughs> Section 275 requires that funding for Dell State's athletic grant be used entirely for female athletes scholarships. Section 276 appropriates funding with Dell Tech for the Associate in Arts Program for jointly operated program between Dell Tech and UD. Section 277 requires all higher ed institutes of Delaware to be members of the National Student Clearinghouse to track students and report data. Section 278 waives all requirements of summer school program for teachers and instructional aides at Dell State and U of D until state funding is appropriated for the program. Section 279 appropriates funds to DIVME for tuition support for Delaware residents studying veterinary medicine at the University of Georgia and Oklahoma State University. Mr. Chairman, that completes the reading of the epilogue for higher education, sections 266 through 279. All right, thank you. Uh, we'd like to, Mr. Chairman, I think we've taken a vote on this separately. Okay. Question about the Senator motion. Party. I'd like to place a hold on section 269. Okay. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, a question on 269 and now the Senator Jansky will hold. But I see all these increases for the different colleges. Is there a certain formula that we use to increase each one of these or that? I'm not hearing you very well, but uh, I think my work might. Uh, Representative, if I'm correct, that will be the, this will be the allocation of the personnel contingency to these lines uh, from the budget office salary contingency in the current year as we move forward, we load them for the following year. So that would be the changes. It's I'm it's I'm just have a question on 270, 271, and 272 into why it takes out a distinct appropriation and just has it um, makes an appropriation because I you know what's that amount going to be? Is that going to be determined somewhere else in the budget? Because before it was stipulated. So that's just my question, which may be able for somebody to answer now. Representative, I can probably answer that for you. The taking out the amounts from the epilogue just saves us from having to update it in two places each year because these amounts are put in the section ones, which you will be voting on later this week. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I think we ought to put the whole unit on hold myself. Um, I'm not prepared to support this until we get a decision on whether they're going to be audited or not. I think we ought to put the whole section on hold. I concur. Mute, mute. Uh, yeah, I, we can certainly put it on hold if that's, if that's the consensus of the committee. The, section, the whole higher education section will be placed on that. Roseanne, education, you're up. All right, Department of Education beginning on page 190, starting with section 280. Section 280 authorizes DOE to make recommendations to the governor and the Joint Finance Committee regarding public education salary schedules. Section 281 outlines goals to implement certain paraprofessional salary level recommendations. Section 282 appropriates funding for world language expansion to implement foreign language offerings in schools. Section 283 appropriates funding for school-based initiatives, including science standards, college readiness, and Delaware State standard teacher initiatives and technology support. Section 284 authorizes DOE to continue the review of special education services with semi-annual oversight groups, including IRMC, the Governor's Office, JFC Chairs, and DOE. Section 285 excludes the stipend payments for nationally certified teachers for leader mentors from the 15% salary supplement limit. Section 286 outlines funding for supplements associated with mentor stipends and national board certifications. Section 287 provides for a $1,000 annual stipend for middle and high school athletic directors who receive national certifications. Section 288 establishes the inflation factor for the local per pupil payments required under the state's enrollment choice and charter school program. Section 289 appropriates funding for Odyssey of the Mind to assist students in defraying out of state program travel expenses. Section 290 gives DOE the right to waive state statutory and regulatory requirements with federal approval of DOE's application for EdFlex. Section 291 eliminates student consequences related to the statewide assessment system. Section 292 exempts certain appropriations from limitations of divisions one and two funding. Section 293 authorizes funding for the first state school and authorizes Medicaid cost recovery. Um, you'll see a strike through here regarding the AI DuPont Hospital, and that is because the AI DuPont Hospital section has been included in the section just following in Section 294. Section 294 appropriates funding for special programming. 
Section 295 appropriates school improvement funds to schools and districts with recognized needs under the Every Student Succeeds Act. Section 296 maintains tax rate ratios at 2010 levels for districts that cross county lines. Section 297 maintains equalization funding at 2009 levels. Section 298 establishes the value of Division II energy and all other cost units. Section 299 appropriates the Educational Sustainment Fund. Sections 300 and 301 would like to be placed on hold. Picking up on section 302 on page 197. Section 302 stipulates that funding for the Delaware Center for Teacher Education is used to support professional and curriculum development for reading and social studies. Section 303 says any district that has failed two consecutive current expense tax referendums can exercise the cash option on academic excellence units. Section 304 allocates education block grant funding to support the annual anti-bullying gay straight alliance summit for members of Delaware middle and high school alliances. Section 305 allocates funding to support speech pathology master's degree program at the University of Delaware. Section 306 establishes uses and positions associated with the Children's Services Cost Recovery Project appropriation for special needs programs. Section 307 establishes equivalent state licensure status for school certified or licensed school psychologists limited to certain services for participation in the Children's Services Cost Recovery Project. Section 308 allocates funding for the Student Discipline Program. Section 309 allocates funding for exceptional student unit vocational for vocational education for students with disability. Section 310 specifies the number, qualifications, and responsibilities for prison education program employees. Section 311 outlines responsibilities and functions of career and technical education work group within DOE. Section 312, I'd like to place that on hold. Section 313 sets driver education programs be at zero for non-public school students. Section 314 also placed that section on hold. Picking up on page 204, section 315. Section 315 expresses intent to address school bus operating cost factors not reflected in the school bus transportation formula. Section 316 requires districts to utilize computerized routing systems called TRIPSPARC for school bus routes. Section 317 requires districts to provide local funds for bus transportation of students in certain high hazards areas. I'd like to hold this section for additional updates. Section 318 requires the Colonial, Red Clay, and Christina School Districts to use state transportation funds for certain students as part of the redesign programs. The underlines that you see in this section are not actually new. They were just reformatted to all be placed in the same section. So they have already been existing within the budget. Section 319, place this on hold as well. Section 320 establishes a 15 member council on education technology. Section 321 specifies that the technology block grant funding is allocated to districts and charters based on the division one unit count for various technology needs. Section 322 says eligible charter schools receiving allocations from the professional accountability and instructional advancement fund, academic excellence and minor capital improvement program are not required to submit an application. Section 323 allocates funding within the scholarships and grants appropriation to specific scholarships. Section 324 says any unused scholarship incentive program funds may be carried into the next year. Section 325 requires Brandywine to maintain its gifted and talented program as a standalone program through the end of the school year. Section 326 amends Delaware code to require districts to use a standard set of program codes when processing transactions in first state financials. Again, the underlines that you see here allow this section to update Delaware code so we don't have to do the upload every year. Section 327 authorizes Christina to operate the Sarah Pyle Academy as a special program on charge tuition for support of the academy. Section 328 prohibits school districts from reallocating state units earned from operating a special school or program with tuition eligible students if the reallocation would require an increase in the tuition tax rate. 
Section 329 outlines the use of seed funds for students attending Dell Tech or U of D. Section 330 outlines the use of Inspire funds for students at Delaware State University. Section 331 says students eligible for seed or Inspire shall receive their earned awards regardless of the appropriated amount, so any shortfalls must be covered by DOE. Section 332 directs DOE to maintain the Sussex County Learning Center at the Dell Tech Owens campus. Section 333 requires all school districts and charters to access the Newcastle County Data Service Center to ensure financial reports remain available. Section 334 requires any district taking a cash or contractual option to submit the documentation to DOE by January 31st. Section 335 authorizes districts to assess a local match for reading and math resource teachers and extra time. Section 336 authorizes districts to enter into an MOU with another district for sharing of central services. Section 337 creates a, certific a certification of earned staff units protocol to ensure districts and charters are using the needs-based funding system appropriately. Section 338 says any regulations DOE determines inconsistent with the Delaware federally approved ESSA plan shall not be applicable. Section 339 authorizes DOE to use alternative measures to determine low socioeconomic status in lieu of free and reduced lunches. Section 340 authorizes districts to utilize unfilled Division I units to address instructional needs. Section 341 and 342, I'd like to place them on hold. Picking up on Section 343 on page 216. Section 343 classifies the International Baccalaureate Program in Red Clay and the Thomas McKean High School Career Pathways programs as magnet programs. Section 344 specifies the use of the Student Success Block Grant for K-3 Special Education and K-4 Reading Interventionists. Section 345 appropriates funding for the Statewide Autism Support Program. Section 346 authorizes local education agencies to request waivers from public school transportation formula if the waivers result in a net savings and those net savings may be shared with the district. Section 347 amends Delaware Code to state that if a charter school audit results in findings that funds have been inappropriately expended, the charter school is responsible for repayment of those funds through local discretionary funds. Section 348 amends Delaware Code to eliminate section on department establishment of regulations on the oversight of district spending, and this is in accordance with Senate Bill 172 of the 149. Section 349 states that any contracts and obligations within DHSS made in functions that are now under DOE through reallocation of federal child care development funds, funding shall remain in full force and effect and be performed by DOE. And this is again associated with the movement of the Office of Child Care Licensing into the Department of Education. Section 350 would like to place that on hold. Mr. Chairman, that completes the reading of the epilogue for the Department of Education. Uh, thank you, Roseanne. Uh, could you repeat that? <laughs> what I'd uh, like to do is that since there's so many sections to make this motion easier, right now we have sections 300, 301, 312, 314, 317, 319. 341 and 342 on hold. Are there any other sections that the members wish to put on hold? So I don't do a 45 minute motion. Ruth Ann is 350 on hold. Okay, hold. Senator Lawson. The one reference to your seed program, I don't see the number right now like that on hold, please. Which one is that? Section 329, Senator. That's correct, thank you, 329. Anyone else? Okay. We'll be a while. 
Under education, I make a motion that sections 280 to 299, we approve as written. We put on hold section 300, section 301 also on hold. Sections 302 to 311 as written and presented, put on hold 312. Approve 313 as written and presented, put on hold 314. Approve 315 and 316 as written, put on hold 317. Approve 318, put on hold 319. Approve 320 through 328 as written, put on hold 329. Approve 330 through 340, put on hold 341, put on hold 342. Approve 343 through 349 as written and put on hold 350 and the motion. I, I have a question on the motion once it's seconded and you open it. I amend my motion to include section 347 on hold. Thanks. That's what we need a second. We need a second to the motion. Second. Okay. Yeah, did you, uh, did you do this? You got a second, right? Okay, so we on the question. All right, these things won't stay in my ear. Yeah, I had uh, just some clarification, please. On section 330. Oh, I'm, wait a minute, before that one. On section 327, uh, where it says Sarah Powell Academy as a special program uh, will be charged tuition for support of the academy. Is that, that charging tuition for, from students? Uh, how is that working? Because it was part of Christina School District. And, and then the other part in here is changing the age group to 16, but under 16. Roseanne, do you have that question? Representative, I believe that is just authorizing the school district to charge tuition tax to pay for the academy. So it is charged through property taxes. Okay, but that, would that depend on the uh, referendum being passed? So that would be charged to whatever district the students are coming from. Okay. And the other question I had on here is the age. Uh, it used to be for children that had less than five credits, there wasn't an age stating that 16 and under, or under 16. That I would have to check because I don't believe the language has been changed in quite some time, but the reference to less than five credits is still there as well. Right, the less than five credits, but they're limiting it. It looks like it's only for ninth graders when it was for anyone that had less than five credits it was based on uh, poor attendance. Uh, you know, kids that they were good students, but they just weren't coming to school to get to obtain the credits. I know we should teach. So I'm questioning the 16 years. It says who are less than 16 years of age. And so you believe that that has changed recently? Yeah. Okay, I can look into that and get back to you. Okay, and then the last question I have is on is section 330. Well, it's actually 331 uh, in reference to Delaware grads. It says that, um, that they can earn scholarship awards regardless of the appropriated, uh, appropriated amount in section one. So what that means is every year, um, Dell State and Dell Tech and UD submit a report to DOE based on what they believe their needs are going to be for seed and inspire. However, if this committee does not appropriate enough money to meet the needs of those students, 
the Department of Education must still fund their awards, but they must fund it within their own budget. So it oh. just makes sure that the students get everything that they need. Okay. Thank you for clearing it up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question, my hands up. Senator Surgeon, you're on. Am I, am I up? Mm -hmm. up, Senator. Okay, thank you, Senator McDowell. I just want to clarify that the motion was indeed amended to remove section 34 for the time being or to put on hold 347. 347. That is correct. Thank you. Any further questions on the motion? Seeing none, uh, we call the roll on the motion, please. Representative Bolden? Yes. Representative Brooks King? Yes. Representative Carson? Yes. Yeah. Senator Ennis? Yes. Representative Hensley? Yes. Representative Jakes? Yes. Senator Lawson? Yes. Senator Pardee? Yes. Senator Richardson? Yes. Senator Sturgeon? Yes. Representative Johnson? Yes. Senator McDowell? Yes. 12, yes. Okay. Senator, All right. I, if I can, just I just want to go back to the higher education section where it was requested to put the entire section on hold. And Senator Ennis, you had mentioned this. So I just want to clarify so that everyone understands what it is that you want answered and from whom. Uh, it was mentioned that you said, and, and I'm assuming you're talking about the University of Delaware and their audit. What would you like to hear back? Uh, Mr. Co-Chairman, what, what I'd like to hear back is uh, the, the chair's joint finance letter to the University of Delaware, as you well know. And uh, I don't know if you got a response or not, but uh, I think, you know, the state we should require uh, not only a response, but a, an audit of the state money. If not, I'm not in favor of supporting the, the uh, request in general assembly budget. We'll need to make sure that obviously the University of Delaware has put on notice to give us an answer as well as who we perhaps need to speak with too is the auditor's office to see how that uh, discussion is going. So get that information. Senator Party, you had something to add? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, I think you just uh, just made my point is I would like to have the state auditor weigh in and I'd like there to be um, some sort of agreement between especially the University of Delaware and the state auditor, um, you know, before we move forward with funding. If for some reason the University of Delaware is tuning in today into our hearings. Uh, I already forwarded you then the, the question at hand. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator McDowell, thank you. Just wanted to get that clarification so we knew what path we had to go down. Uh, we can discuss it too. Thank you, Senator. I, I just want to add uh, one piece into the conversation to address both Senator's concerns. All, all I would respectfully ask is that we also give consideration to what is already in the Delaware Code with regard to uh, the auditing piece and that we just consider that as well as you look for your uh, path forward. That's all. Thank you. Mr. Representative Carson. Thank You have to hold it down unless it's malfunctioning. <laughs> I got that chainsaw, post hole diggers, everything out in the truck. Okay. 
Thank you. Although I agree that uh, we should have a conversation about an audit, is that what this committee actually does? This is the Joint Finance Committee talking about approving revenues. Uh, is something maybe we should ask an attorney if this committee has the power to tell them they have an audit or should that be legislation on the floor to determine whether an organization like that needs an audit? I guess have the power to withhold funds for them, but I, I think it'd be good to see whether this committee has those has the authority to actually do that or be done on the floor. Well, uh, let me just take a quick stab at that for overview. I, I mean, we have the authority to ask them questions. Uh, they have the authority not to answer or answer or, or answer and. Uh, and then we have the authority to give them all of their requests or some of their requests. I don't, uh, Thank you. Your point's been made, sir. Let's take a 15 minute break and come back refreshed.
Okay. Welcome back, committee. Um, today I'm going to ask the controller general where he'd like us to. Okay. In your booklets, if you would turn to the CGO markup adjustment tab, we are going to run through a few of the uh, section ones for the various departments. We're going to touch on some of the easier ones today to finish up today's uh, voting. Uh, so we are going to start on page one. You are on, you're on tab CGO markup adjustments. Is everybody there? Page one. So if everybody's there, we're going to start at page one, legislative. Is everybody there? All right, uh, a little different format than you've seen in past years. Uh, to the far left, you see are the, all the appropriation lines. Uh, in the middle of the page under the green column headings, you'll see GRB. Under that list, you will see all the recommendations that were included in the governor's 21 recommended budget. Uh, based on what we went through earlier today on the financial plan, the idea that we would be going through and reducing from all the departments, all the enhancement monies uh, that were added to the budget and we would be funding only door openers. So if you look out to the right, you will see throughout all the departments, uh, all the cuts that are being made, which will essentially fund a FY20 20 budget with the only new monies being uh, uh, door openers. So, for example, if you're looking here at uh, legislative, in the middle of the column, you'll see that there is uh, four lines there for the personnel contingency. Those are door openers. They have to pay for uh, last year's salary policy, last year's changes in health insurance, etc. So, those are door openers for the legislative branch. The four items below that dues increase for CSG, NCSL, U of D, and uniform state laws are in some measures enhancements to the budget. I am gonna cover those with carryover monies for the upcoming year, so we can reduce that. So if you look out to the far right, the JFC vote that you are gonna to take today for legislative would be to reduce all those lines so that essentially the legislative budget for FY21 will be the same as FY20. And that is the same exercise you will see going forward with the remainder of the departments. Adding, obviously adding personnel contingencies. Uh, if a position last year was funded for 10 months, we have to include funding next year for the uh, remaining two months. Uh, we have to fund uh, uh, teacher enrollment in public ed, all those door openers, which we really have no control over, those will continue to be funded. But anything that is termed or deemed an enhancement will be cut. So obviously you, you'll have questions as, as we go through the, each of the departments. So feel free to speak up and we'll answer any questions that you may have, but I will turn it over to Ruth Ann for legislative, but I think I'll probably explain it, but Ruth Ann. Thank you. So on the first tab, legislative- Roseanne, oh, Roseanne, let me hold you up a little bit here. I, would, I think I have some questions uh, as to what was explained. And it, am I alone or anybody else there have some questions from, uh, from the explanation? All right, uh, Dave, uh, Senator Lawson, I'll let you go first and, and then I'll pull mine out. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mike, I just wanted to clarify you're funding what out of excess? Uh, your last word was excess? Yes, out of the excess, what are you funding? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, in legislative, we are, we are funding the 86.3. 
if you look under the, the blue, the uh, green column in the middle, GRB, we have included in there the 86.3 for the House Personnel Contingency, 57.7 for the Senate, Division of Research 169 and Controller General's Office 14.8. Those are included in the governor's recommended budget. If you look out to the right under the JFC vote, they are not cut. So they are remaining in the budget because they are door openers. If you look down below, you have four additional requests, 7, 9, 13, 9, 30,000, point seven for those other initiatives. Those are, turn, are deemed enhancements. We are going to cut those from the FY21 governor's recommendation. So that essentially the legislative budget will be exactly the same as it was in FY20. I got that. Okay. What I don't have is when you made a statement, you're going to fund something out of excess. What was it that you're going to fund that you said anyway, that you were going to fund out of excess, out of the excess money? I have some continuing money in my, in my office. And I'm going to use that continuing money to pay for uh, these dues. I have carryover money in my, in, in, for example, I have uh, carryover money in my contractual services line for the past couple of years. I will use that money to pay for these dues. And these dues are uh, additions to what's already in the base. So they're coming out of my shop with my carryover money. But they're still being funded. They're still being funded. That is correct. Thank you. Mute. I'm going to ask you one probably foolish question, Mike. How do I know the difference between the top four figures and the bottom four figures? Are the exact same? Uh, type of figure they're in black or they're not in parentheses uh, and they're in the same place in in the uh, spreadsheet so how do I know that the four at the top are one thing and the four that is correct they're red and they're negative meaning they're red So I'm clear on that. Okay. Uh, right. Every, okay. Every, everything out to the right, if it is being reduced, you will see it as a um, in parens. Okay. You ready? Roseanne? Thank you, Senator. All right. Under Department 010000, which is Department Legislative. The section one as written totals out to $17,514,700. In order to meet the FY21 budget guidelines, we need to reduce the CESG dues increase by 7.9, reduce the NCSL dues increase by 13.9, reduce the UD Senior Center formula update by 30,000, and reduce the uniform state laws dues increase by $700, bringing the new FY21 total for legislative to $17,462,200. That completes the budget changes for the legislative section one. Which one? So the final um, budget for legislative should be seventeen million four hundred sixty-two thousand two hundred dollars. That's correct. Senator, I'd like to make a motion 
that we approve the legislative section 01-00-00 and uh, fund per the presentation to $17,462,200. Second. We moved and seconded. Are there questions on the motion? Second. Any questions on the motion? <laughs> Seeing none. Uh, roll call. We have a roll call, please. Representative Bolden? Yes. Representative Briggs King? Yes. Representative Carson? Yes. Senator Adams? Yes. Representative Hensley? Yes. Representative Jakes? Yes. Senator Lawson? Yes. Senator Pardee? Yes. Senator Richardson? Yes. Senator Surgeon? Yes. Representative Johnson? Yes. Senator McDowell? Yes. 12 yes. Uh, let the record reflect that's passed unanimously. Okay, we have judicial next. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we want to skip to, we're going to skip around on a few of these because uh, there are going to be some changes and additional discussions. I think we we'll just want to okay. breeze through a few of these. Next one would be DTI. And I'll turn it to Julie. That would be on page 10. Page 10. Everyone have page 10? Okay, so page 10, Department of Technology and Information, Department 11-00-00. Uh, we started with a FY21 governor's recommended budget of $50,850,800. We are going to be reducing that by two FTE and general fund and $800,000 for a new total of $50,050,800. And that is the final reductions to the GRB for Department of Technology and Information. Yeah, each, each one. Mr. Mr. Chairman, on uh, page 10, next to the 800,000 there, parens, uh, unfortunately it did not come through. There should be a minus two under the general fund positions there. If you see that'll line up with what was added to the left in the governor's recommended budget. So we're just going through and taking out what was added in, in, in the GRB. So it'll be a minus two positions under K to 12 needs minus eight hundred thousand dollars. Representative Briggs King has a question. Representative Briggs King. Thank you. I just wanted to question, particularly since we're having so many challenges with um, online education, we're having to do things different. Um, that you know, eliminating these these two positions. Um, won't impede the progress that we want to make or we're making towards um, online and at home instruction, particularly in the schools, because this is a K through 12. So I don't know if it's already being done. If so, that's great. But it was just a question I had because we're placing more emphasis than ever on that ability. Ready an answer? Mike Jackson. So Representative Brickstein, that's a good question. Uh, in the phase three of the stimulus funding, there was a specific funding going to our schools uh, that will cover this expense at least through fiscal year 2021. Yep. Are there any other questions? Representative Jakes, you had your hand up at one point. No, no, I, I, Mr. Jackson. All right, Mr. Co-Chair. Mr. Co-Chair, we need uh, I'd like to make a motion that under Department of Technology and Information, Section 11-00-01, that we approve 
the document as amended by the Controller General's Office uh, markup document totaling $50,050,800. And a motion. Second. Move to second and questions on the motion. Seeing none, and we have a roll call. Representative Bolden. Yes. Representative Briggs King. Yes. Representative Carson. Yes. <coughs> Senator Ennis. Yes. Representative Hensley. Yes. Representative Jakes. Senator Lawson? Yes. Senator Pardee? Yes. Senator Richardson? Yes. Senator Sturgeon? Yes. Representative Johnson? Yes. Senator McDowell? Yes. 12, yes. The record reflect that's unanimous. Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman, we're now going to do pages 11 through 14, other electives, and I'll turn it over to Jason. All right. Good afternoon. So page 11 is for the Office of the Lieutenant Governor at the top of the state 12-01. Um, there are essentially no real substantive changes here. The GRB for this office is $630,700. Um, the personnel contingency is remaining in there, so that is um, that final number is remaining the same for the lieutenant governor's office. Um, I didn't know, Mr. Chairman, if you'd like me to continue with the auditor or if you'd like to take a roll. Or... Yeah. All right. So moving on to the next page, uh, page 12 is the auditor of the accounts. And essentially what's happening here, if you're looking on the left-hand side of this column, you'll see under the JFC vote that the uh, the FY21 GRB has started uh, with a general fund appropriation of a little over $3 million and an ASF appropriation of one, uh, a little over 1.3. There are four requests that are listed on this page. Uh, these requests uh, are viewed as discretionary uh, and we are reducing these requests out. Uh, that would be the auditor position, uh, minusing out one FTE and $65,600. Uh, the contractual service funding for $168,400, supplies and materials, and the travel funding. Um, this brings the total to the for the auditor of accounts for a general fund appropriation of $2,791,600, and ASF funding of $1,330,400. Um, if you'd like to flip to the next page, page 13 for the insurance commissioner. Um, there are essentially no changes to this uh, budget from what you saw in February. Um, so, and there is also no uh, general fund appropriation to the insurance commissioner office. They are um, all ASF funded. Uh, so the numbers here are, are remaining the same. ASF appropriation of $26,868,700 for the insurance commissioner. Um, and then lastly, uh, if you turn to page 14, you'll see the state treasurer. And again, this there is really only uh, one substantive change here, uh, just to uh, go over on the general fund side for the uh, FY21 GRB, we're a little over 204 million and 77 million, 77.9 million in ASF. The only change here that you'll see on the right hand side is the 13. Uh, 0.5 million reduction for debt, debt service that Director Jackson uh, discussed this morning uh, with the committee. That would bring the overall total uh, for the state treasurer's office for a general fund appropriation of $190,877,100 and an ASF funding of $77,962,700. Um, and that concludes uh, the state treasurer and other elective, I'm sorry. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Mr. Co-Chairman, I believe we started on, uh, do we do or skip page 11? Yep, we, we started on Lieutenant Governors. So do you want uh, all four? Okay. I uh, make a motion that under the section for Lieutenant Governor 120101, 
uh, that we approve section one as amended by the controller general's markup document totaling 630,700, as well as turning to the auditor of accounts 120201 that we approve the section one as amended by the controller general's markup document totaling $1,330,400 in AF ASF funds and $2,791,600 in general funds, as well as moving to the insurance commissioner 12-03-00, that we approve the section, section one as amended by the controller general's markup document totaling $26,868,700 ASF funds. And finally, in the motion, moving to the state treasurer's office, 12500, that we approve section one as amended by the controller general's markup document, uh, totaling 77,962,700 ASF funds and 190,877,100 in general funds in the motion. Second. Been moved and seconded on the motion. Any questions on the motion? Seeing none. Representative Bowen. Bowen, Representative. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. On the auditors, so my, uh, my question is regarding the auditor uh, position, the additional state auditor three position. You know, why is this being cut? or taken out when we're doing more uh, auditing and when you're looking at some of the other things that they're asking specifically, do you want the university to be audited? And the other was on, on the travel, how do they maintain their professionalism and keep up with every other state uh, going forward if we continue to take things out of that department? Uh, Representative, I think I can try to answer that question for you. Um, so the, the auditor position, it's my understanding that this was actually a position that they had offered as a, to be reclassed as a human resource uh, specialist position over when they had some, some HR issues probably about a year or so ago. Uh, this was a budget request and an attempt to get that particular position back. Um, so it, it's not necessarily taking an auditor position. It was, it was just kind of restoring back to the complement of where it originally was maybe a year or two ago. Um, and then as far as the travel funds, I mean, this isn't their entire travel line and, or their supplies and materials. I mean, they do have an appropriation, you know, an existing appropriation to assist with that. Um, so even though, yes, this may say that, you know, this was for professional development and things like that, that was what the professional request was for. They still have the ability to do that if they would choose to. But this, these were things they asked for funding for it as not being funded, correct? These are things that they've asked for, but they do currently already receive contractual services and supplies and travel. They already have an appropriation for that. Um, this would have been kind of above and beyond. I mean, this was a request, so it wasn't, we were viewing it as a, as not a discretionary or as a uh, you know, kind of a discretionary item, not as a, as a door opener or something that would be necessary. What about the funding for software? Uh, again, they have they have a contractual services funding line already, so they're they're they already have the ability to procure software if they would like. Um, this would have been an, an extra, you know, resource for them if they had received it. Uh, can we have a vote on that last uh, motion, please? Representative Bolton? Yes. Representative Briggs-King? Yes. 
Representative Carson? Yes. Senator Annis? Representative Hensley? Yes. Representative Jakes? Yes. Senator Lawson? Yes. Senator Pardee? Yes. yes. Senator Richardson? Yes. Yes. Senator, Senator Sturgeon? Yes. Representative Johnson? Yes. Senator McDowell? Yes. 12 yes. All right, let the record reflect that's passed unanimously. Mike? Sorry, Mr. Chairman, if you would uh, turn to page 17, Department of Human Resources, I'll turn it over to Victoria. Victoria, it's all yours. All right, what you have in front of you on page 17 shows you the requests that were made uh, in the governor's recommended budget. What you will see that is being removed is 190,000 for talent acquisition efforts for hard to fill vacancies. This was funding to support a second phase of their statewide marketing and advertising campaign. And then 5,000, which was attributed to funding for compliance with the governor's executive order, um, naming Delaware as a trauma informed state. Uh, our total for general fund changes is 23,191,300. And that concludes the numbers for Department of Human Resource. Okay, um, we, have, we have the numbers. Uh, is that, Mike, do you wanna go, any others in this? Uh, if you okay, if you want to do another one, if you would turn to page uh, twenty, Department of Finance, and Ruth Ann. All right, the Department of Finance, which is Department twenty five oh 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 oh, the Department of Finance did not make any general fund requests. Um, so there are no general fund reductions to their budget. So their budget remains flat um, as to what was in the governor's recommended budget. So their total is an ASF budget of $126,701,000 or 701,000 and a general fund budget of $14,543,000. Thank you. I think, uh, Mr. Co-Chairman, we take a vote on this because the second one we have to vote on also. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, so under the Department of Human Resources section, section 160000, I make a motion that we approve the section one as amended by the Controller General's Office markup document totaling $5,362,300 in ASF funds and $23,191,300 in general funds. In addition, over to the Department of Finance, 25-00-00, that we approve the section one as amended by the Comptroller General's markup document that actually showed no reductions, totaling 126,701,000 in ASF funds and 14,543,000 in general funds. End of motion. Second. We've been seconded. Um, what page is that that had no recommendations on? It was on, uh, that was on page 20, then the totals are on page 21. Okay. All right, we have a motion for us. Uh, oh. Call call the roll, uh, and question. Oh, question. Okay, you hear me now. All right, on page seventeen, my question again is. Um, on the trauma, the trauma-informed care with the COVID-19 and everything's going on. Can you add, tell me, explain to me why this is being removed? Mr. Jackson? 
I guess. Sure. I don't know because I mean, with everyone being secure, yeah. So this is not this is not an expense that's related to COVID nineteen. This is a is. this is an expense that was related to an initiative from the governor's services, uh, the governor's family services cabinet council. That as a cabinet, given the um, uh, uh, level of revenue loss that we've experienced over the last two years. We've agreed to be able to look internally for the funds to be able to, to deliver the trauma-informed care training. And by the way, funding that the Secretary of Human Resources is losing, it's it's was an enhancement to their budget. Thank you. All right. Uh, this is ridiculous. Need that roll call now? They're not cutting off, please. They still have the same amount of trauma they've ever. Is that a Bolton? A lot of these are proposed. Right. Uh, in addition to, we're not doing any work. Representative Bolton. In that. Uh, yes. Representative Briggs King. Yes. Representative Carson? Yes. Senator Ennis? Yes. Representative Hensley? Yes. Representative Jakes? Yes. Senator Lawson? Yes. Senator Pardee? Yes. Senator Richardson? Yes. Is even anything extra? Senator Sturgeon? Yes. Representative Johnson? Yes. Senator McDowell? Yes. 12 yes. Which the record should reflect that that was passed unanimously. And, uh, we're looking for more pages. Yes, Mr. Chairman, if you go to page 38, Department of Agriculture. Our culture is Julie. Okay, so for Department of Agriculture, we started with a governor's recommended budget of, in general funds, 8625200 Keeping personnel contingency under the request, we are removing funding for the healthy Food retail program of $64,000, removing funding for agriculture compliance of $15,000, removing funding from governor's recommended budget for nutrient management of $5,200, and we are removing funding for the animal health digital application for $25,000 for a total in the governor's, uh, or in the general fund of $8,516,000. And that is the total for adjustments to the Department of Agriculture governor's recommended budget. Okay. Move to elections. Okay. I'd like to make a motion that under the Department of Agricultural 65-00-00 that we approve section one as amended by the Controller General's markup document uh, totaling $7,550,300 in ASF funds and $8,516,000 in general funds. End of motion. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there, are there any questions on the motion? This is where the cows come up. All right. All the, let's have a roll call on the, on the uh, motion, please. please. Representative Bolden. Yes. Representative Briggs King. Yes. Representative Carson. Yes. Senator Ennis. Yes. Representative Hensley. Yes. Representative Jakes. Yes. Senator Lawson. Yes. Senator Pardee. Yes. Senator Richardson? Yes. Senator Sturgeon? Yes. Representative Johnson? 
Yes. Senator McDowell. Yes. 12 yes. Election has passed unanimously. And uh, we'll look for another. Chairman, next page, former elections, page 39. So for department, yes, for Department of Elections, there were no modifications and there was an addition for other adjustments for primary and general elections. So under the total for Department of Elections is $10,299,500. Want to continue on next page, page 40, uh, Fire Prevention Commission. Page 40. Okay. Hey, committee members, what you have in front of you is the numbers for Fire Prevention Commission. What you will see is uh, this markup adjustment document has given them the personnel contingency for fiscal year 2020 um, and all other requests for uh, this fiscal year were not awarded. So that would take out the yearly user licenses, the Delaware State Fire School information system, the administrative specialist, um, as well as training opportunities for a grand total in general funds of $5,636,900. If there are no questions, after regards, page 41. Okay, on page 41, the Delaware National Guard, the governor's recommended budget gave the general funds of 4,959,900. There are no changes to their request for this year, so they will end uh, or begin the fiscal year for FY21 with 4,959,900. All right, no questions. Uh, next page, page 42, Governor's Advisory Council for Exceptional Citizens. So the Governor's Advisory Council for Exceptional Citizens had a FY21 GRB of 276 for general funds. We are uh, requesting to remove 1,000 for Wi-Fi installation annual service fee for an, uh, 275,000 for general funds. That's it. Yep. I would like to make a motion under the Department of Elections, Section 70-00-00, that we approve the Section 1 as amended by the Controller General's markup document totaling 10,299.5. Then we move over to the Fire Prevention Commission, 75-0-00. Uh, and approve section one as amended by the Controller General's markup document for AFS, ASF to 1,474,700 and ASF 5,636,900 in general funds. Moving to the Delaware National Guard, section 76-00-00, that we approve section one as amended by the Controller General's Office markup document, totaling in 4,959,900 in general funds. And last to the motion, the Governor's Advisory Council for Exceptional Citizens, 77-00-00, that we approve section one as amended by the Controller General's markup document, uh, totaling 275,000 in general funds and the motion. Okay, we have a motion before us. Do I have a second? Second. We have a, a question I want to ask. We have a Wi-Fi installation annual service fee 
of one thousand dollars, and that's removed. Is that is that a Wi-Fi that they need to keep? It seems. Uh, Mike, my job. The short answer, Senator, is is yes, but we have technology funding uh, in the Office of Management and Budget, and we will cover that thousand dollar cost for them for fiscal. Very year. good, very good. Thank you. Um, Bruce, you're on mute. Oh, I'm not. Um, so when we're looking at the, um, for the licensing, I'm thinking that the licensing is so that everybody in the facility would have access to a program and we're eliminating that so that only a few, is that what we mean by licensing under the, um, the Fire Prevention Commission? The fire school or fire the school. fire commission has money to, in ASF, to fund this. Um, they've been depleting that over some time and we were going to give it to them in the general fund, but they do have funds to support that yearly service license fee, right? Thank you. Representative Carr. I think the chairman keeps muting me. I'd like to go to the administrative specialist too for the fire commission. Um, I think this is actually more of uh, more for the uh, for the, the actually for the fire school uh, that does the, the investigations, inspections, licensing, and certificates. They're listed under the commission, but I think they actually work for the fire school. This was a this was a requested extra position, correct? Yes. Yes, that's correct. Okay. I'm okay. Representative Bolton. Yes. Representative Briggs King? Yes. Representative Carson? Yes. Senator Ennis? Yes. Representative Hensley? Yes. Representative Jakes? I'm yes for everything and absolutely for 7,600. <laughs> Senator Lawson? Yes. Senator Party? Yes. Senator Richardson? Yes. Senator Sturgeon? Yes. Representative Johnson? Yes. Senator McDowell? Yes. 12 yes. All right, well. I think we've had a good body of work. I want to thank you all for coming here today, prepared to work and getting at it. I think we've made a very, very good start. Uh, and I think uh, we've all got a little bit better understanding of what we're up against to get a budget. So. Having a good start is a good thing, but it isn't anything final. So, uh, we'll committee will come back at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning.